Hey! Answer me! Stand and unfold yourself! Long live the king! Bernardo? He! You come most carefully upon your hour. Tis now struck twelve. Get thee to bed, Francisco. For this relief, much thanks. It is bitter cold, and I am sick at heart. Have you had quiet guard? Not a mouse stirring. Well, good night. If you do meet Horatio and Marcellus, the rivals of my watch, bid them make haste. I think I hear them. Stand! Who's there? Friends to this crowd, and liegemen to the dame. Give you good night. Oh, farewell, honest soldier. Who hath relieved you? Bernardo has my place. Give you good night. Hola. Bernardo? Say, what? Is Horatio there? Oh, a piece of him. Welcome, Horatio. Welcome, good Marcellus. What? Has this thing appeared again tonight? I have seen nothing. Horatio says tis but our fantasy. Ah. But will not let the leaf take hold of him, touching this dreaded sight. Twice seen of us. Therefore I have entreated him along with us to watch the minutes of this night. That if again this apparition come, he may approve our eyes and speak to it. <laughs> tush, tush. It will not appear. Sit down a while and let us once again assail your ears that are so fortified against our story what we two knights have seen. Well, <laughs> sit we down. Uh, let us hear Bernardo speak of this. Last night of all, when yon same star that's westward from the Po had made his course to illume that part of heaven where now it burns, Marcellus and myself, the bell then beating one. Peace! Break thee off! Look where it comes again! In the same figure like the king that's dead, thou art a scholar! Speak to it, Horatio! Looks it not like the king? Mark it, Horatio! Most like. It harrows me with fear and wonder. It would be spoke to. Question it, Horatio! What art thou that usurps this time of night, together with that fair and warlike form in which the majesty of very Denmark did sometimes march? By heaven, I charge thee, speak! It is offended. See, it stalks away. Stay. Speak. Speak. I charge thee, speak. It is gone. And will not answer. How now, Horatio? You tremble and look pale. <laughs> is not this something more than fantasy? What think you on? Oh, my God. I might not disbelieve, without the sensible and true virtue of mine own eyes. Is it not like the king? As thou art to thyself. Such was the very armor he had on, when he, the ambitious Norway, combated. So frowned he once, when in an angry pile he smote the sledded polex on the ice. Oh, tis strange. Thus twice before, and just at this dead hour, with martial stalk hath he gone by our watch. In what particular thought to work, I know not. But in the gross and scope of my opinion, this bodes some strange eruption to our state. Good now. Sit down. And tell me, he that knows, why this same strict and most observant watch so nightly toils the subject of the land. And why such daily cast of brazen cannon and foreign mart for implements of war? Why such impressive shipwrights whose sore task does not divide the Sunday from the week? What might be toward that this sweaty haste doth make the night joint labor with the day? Who is that can inform me? That can I. At least the whisper goes so. Our last king, whose image even but now appeared to us, was, as you know, by Fortin Brass of Norway, thereto pricked on by a most emulate pride, dared to the combat. 
in which our valiant Hamlet, for so this side of our known world esteemed him, did slay this Fortin Rat, who by a sealed compact, well ratified by law and heraldry, did forfeit with his life all those his lands which he stood seized on to the conqueror, against which a moiety competent was gauged by our king, which had returned to the inheritance of Fortin Brass had he been vanquisher, as by the same covenant and carriage of the article designed, his fell to Hamlet. Now, sir, young Fortin Brass, of unimproved metal, hot and full, hath in the skirts of Norway here and there sharked up a list of lawless resolutes for food and diet to some enterprise that hath a stomach it, which is no other, and it doth well appear unto our state, but to recover of us by strong hand and terms compulsory those forced lands so by his father lost. And this, I take it, is the main motive of our preparations, the source of this our watch, and the chief head of this post-haste and rummage in the land. I think it be no other but Ian so. Well may it sort that this portentous figure comes armed through our watch so like the king that was and is the question of these wars. A mote it is to trouble the mind's eye. In the most high and palmy state of Rome, a little ere the mightiest Julius fell, the grave stood tenantless, and the sheeted dead did squeak and gibber in the Roman streets, that stars with trains of fire and dews of blood, disasters in the sun. And the moist star, upon whose influence Neptune's empire stands, was sick almost to doomsday with eclipse. And even the light precursor of feared events, as harbingers preceding still the fates, and prologue to the omen coming on, have heaven and earth together demonstrated unto our climatures and countrymen. But soft, behold, lo, when it comes again, I'll crush it though it blast me. Stay, illusion, if thou hast any sound or use of voice, speak to me. If there be any good thing to be done, that may to thee do ease and grace to me, speak to me. If thou art privy to thy country's fate, which happily foreknowing may avoid, oh, speak. Or if thou hast abhorred in thy life, exalted treasure in the womb of earth, for which they say, you spirits of walking death, speak of it, stay, and speak. Stop it, Marcellus! Shall I strike at it with my partisans? No, if it will not stand, it is here, it is here. It is gone. Do it wrong, being so majestical, to offer it the show of violence. For it is as the air invulnerable, and our vein blows malicious mockery. It was about to speak when the cock crew. And then it started like a guilty thing, upon a fearful summons. I have heard the cock that is the trumpet to the morn doth with his lofty and shrill sounding throat awake the god of day and at his warning whether in sea or fire in earth or air the extravagant and erring spirit hies to his confine and of the truth herein his present object made probation it faded on the crowing of the cock some say that ever gainst that season comes wherein our saviour's birth is celebrated the bird of dawning singeth all night long. And then, they say, no spirit dare stir abroad. The nights are wholesome, then no planet strike, no fairy takes, nor witch hath power to charm. So hallowed and so gracious is the time. So have I heard, and do in part believe it. But look, the morn in russet mantle clad, 
walks o'er the dew of yon high eastern hill. Break we our watch up, and by my advice, let us impart what we have seen tonight unto young Hamlet. For upon my life, this spirit, dumb to us, will speak to him. Do you consent we shall acquaint him with it? As needful in our loves, fitting our duty. Let's do it, I pray. And I this morning know where we shall find him most conveniently. Hamlet, our dear brother's death, the memory be green, and that it us be fitted to bear our hearts in grief, and our whole kingdom to be contracted in one brow of woe. Yet so far hath discretion fought with nature, that we with wisest sorrow think on him, together with remembrance of ourselves. Therefore, our sometime sister, now our queen. <laughs> the imperial jointress of this warlike state have we as twere with a defeated joy with one auspicious and one drooping eye with mirth in funeral and with dirge in marriage in equal scale weighing delight and dough taken to wife <laughs> Nor oh, have we here in barred your better wisdoms, which have freely gone with this affair along, for all our thanks. <laughs> now follows that you know, young Fortinbras, holding a weak supposal of our worth, or thinking by our late dear brother's death, our state to be disjoint and out of frame, colleaguid with the dream of his advantage. He hath not failed to pester us with message, importing the surrender of those lands lost by his father, with all bonds of law, to our most valiant brother. So much for him. <laughs> now, for ourself and for this time of meeting, thus much the business is. We have here writ to Norway, uncle of young Fortinbras, who impotent, and bedrid, scarcely hears of this his nephew's purpose, to suppress his further gate herein, in that the levies, the lists, and full proportions are all made out of his subject. And we here dispatch you, good Cornelius, and you, Voltimand, for bearers of this greeting to old Norway, giving to you no further personal power to business with the king, more than the scope of these dilated articles allow. Farewell. And let your haste commend your duty. In, in that, that and in all, all things will we show our duty. duty. We doubt it nothing. Artily, farewell. Farewell. And now, Laertes, what's the news with you? <laughs> eh, you told us of some suit. What is, Laertes? Oh, you cannot speak of reason to the Dane and lose your voice. <laughs> what wouldst thou beg, Laertes, that should not be my offer, not thy asking? The head is not more native to the heart, the hand more instrumental to the mouth, than is the throne of Denmark to thy father. What wouldst thou have, Laertes? Dread, my lord, your leave and favour to return to France. <laughs> From whence, though willingly, I came to Denmark to show my duty in your coronation. Yet now I must confess that duty done, my thoughts and wishes bend again towards France, and bow them to your gracious leave and pardon. Have you your father's leave? Eh, what says Polonius? He hath, my lord, wrung from me my slow leave by laboursome petition. <laughs> and at last, upon his will, I sealed my hard consent. I do beseech you, give him leave to go. Take thy fair alertes, time be thine, and thy best graces, spend it at thy will. <laughs> but now, my cousin Hamlet and my son, a little more than kin, and less than kind. How is it that the clouds still hang on you? Not so, my lord, I am too much of the sun. Good Hamlet, cast thy nighted colour off, and let thine eye look like a friend on Denmark. Do not forever with thy veiled lids seek for thy noble father in the dust. Thou knowest tis common. 
All that lives must die, passing through nature to eternity. Aye, madam, it is common. If it be, why seems it so particular with thee? Seems, madam? Nay, it is. I know not seems. Tis not alone my inky cloak, good mother, nor customary suits of solemn black, nor windy suspiration of forced breath, no, nor the fruitful river in the eye, nor the dejected haviour of the visage, together with all forms, moods, shows of grief that can denote me truly, these indeed seem, for they are actions that a man might play. But I have that within me which passeth show, these but the trappings and the suits of woe. Tis sweet and commendable in your nature, Hamlet, to give these mourning duties to your father. But you must know your father lost a father. That father lost, lost his. And the survivor bound in filial obligation for some term to do obsequious sorrow, but to persevere in obstinate condolement, is a cause of impious stubbornness. Tis unmanly grief. It shows a will most incorrect to heaven, a heart unfortified, a mind impatient, an understanding simple and unschooled, for what we know must be, and is as common as any, the most vulgar thing to sense. Why should we, in our peevish opposition, take it to heart? Fie, it is a fault to heaven, a fault against the dead, a fault to nature, to reason most absurd, whose common theme is death of fathers, and who still hath cried from the first corpse till he that died today, this must be so. We pray you throw to earth this unprevailing woe, and think of us as of a father. For let the world take note, you are the most immediate to our throne, and with no less nobility of love than that which dearest father bears his son do I impart towards you. For your intent in going back to school in Wittenberg it is most retrograde to our desire, and we beseech you, bend you, to remain here in the cheer and comfort of our eye, our chiefest courtier, cousin, and our son. Let not thy mother lose her prayers, Hamlet. I pray thee, stay with us. Go not to Wittenberg. I shall in all my best obey you, madam. For it is a loving and a fair reply. Be as ourself in Denmark. Madam, come. This gentle and unforced accord of Hamlet's, it's smiling to my heart. In grace whereof, no jock and health, the Denmark thinks today, but the great cannon to the cloud shall tell. Yeah. And the king's rouse, the heaven shall <laughs> brew it again, re-speaking <laughs> earthly thunder. <laughs> come away! <laughs> Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew. Or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. Oh, God, God, how weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. Violent, ah, fie! Tis an unweeded garden that grows to seed, things rank and gross in nature possess it merely. That it should come to this, but two months dead, nay, not so much, not two. So excellent a king that was to this Hyperion to a satyr. So loving to my mother that he might not beteem the winds of heaven, visit her face too roughly. Heaven and earth must I remember. Where she would hang on him as if increase of appetite had grown by what it fed on. And yet within a month, let me not think on Frailty, thy name is woman, a little month, or ere those shoes were old with which she followed my poor father's body like Niobe, all tears. Why, she, even she, oh God, a beast that wants discourse of reason would have mourned longer married with my uncle.
My father's brother, but no more like my father than I to Hercules within a month. Uh, yet the salt of most unrighteous tears had left the flushing in her gored eyes she married. Oh, most wicked speed, to post with such dexterity to incestuous sheets. It is not, nor it cannot come to good. But break my heart, for I must hold my tongue. Hail to your lordship. I am glad to see you well. <laughs> or I do forget myself! Same, my lord, <laughs> and your poor servant ever. Sir, my good friend, I'll change that name with you. And what make you from Wittenberg, Horatio? Marcellus! My good lord. I'm very glad to see you. Bernardo! My lord. But what in faith make you from Wittenberg? A truant disposition, good my lord. I would not have your enemy say so, nor shall you do my ear that violence to make a truster of your own report against yourself. I know you are no truant. <laughs> but what is your affair in Elsinore? will teach you to drink, D. Bear, you depart. My lord, I came to see your father's funeral. I pray thee do not mock me, fellow student. I think it was to see my mother's wedding. Indeed, my lord. It followed hard upon. Thrift, thrift, Horatio. The funeral baked meats did coldly furnish forth the marriage tables. Would I had met my dearest foe in heaven or ever I had seen that day, Horatio. My father. Mm -hmm. Methinks I see my father. Oh, where, my lord? In my mind's eye, Horatio. I saw him once. He was a goodly king. He was a man. Take him for all in all. I shall not look upon his like again. My lord, I think I saw him yesternight. Hmm? So? Who? My lord the king, your father. King, my father? Season your admiration for a while with an attent ear till I may deliver upon the witness of these gentlemen this marvel to you. Oh, for God's love, let me hear. Two nights together had these gentlemen, Marcellus and Bernardo, on their watch in the dead waste and middle of the night been thus encountered. A figure like your father, armed at all points exactly, cap a pay, appears before them and with solemn march goes slow and stately by them. Thrice he walked by their oppressed and fear surprised eyes within his truncheon's length, whilst they, distilled almost to jelly with the act of fear, stand dumb and speak not to him. <sighs> this to me in dreadful secrecy in part they did, and I with them the third night kept the watch, where, as they had delivered, both in time, form of the thing, each word made true and good. The apparition comes. I knew your father. These hands are not more like. But where was this? My lord, upon the platform where we watched. Well, did you not speak to it? My lord, I did, but answer made it none. Yet once methought it lifted up its head and did address itself to motion like as it would speak. But even then the morning cock crew loud, and at the sound it shrunk in haste away and vanished from our sight. It is very strange. As I do live, my honoured lord, it is true. And we did think it writ down in our duty to let you know of it. Indeed, indeed, sirs, but this troubles me. Hold you the watch tonight. We, we do, do, my lord. lord. Armed, say you. Armed, Armed my, my lord. lord. From top to toe? My lord. From head to foot. Well, then saw you not his face? Oh, yes, my lord. He wore his beaver up. What looked he? Frowningly? A countenance more in sorrow than in anger. Pale or red? Nay, very pale. And fixed his eyes upon you? Most constantly. I would I had been there. It would have much amazed you. Very like. Very like. Stayed it long? While one with moderate haste might tell a hundred. Longer? Longer. Not when I saw it. His beard was grizzled, no? It was, as I have seen it in his life. A sable silvered. I will watch tonight. Perchance twill walk again. I warrant you it will. If it assume my noble father's person, I'll speak to it, though hell itself should gape and bid me hold my peace. I pray you all, if you have hitherto concealed this sight, let it be tenable in your silence still, and whatsomever else shall hap tonight. Give it an understanding, but no tongue. I will requite your loves. So fare you well. Upon the platform, twixt eleven and twelve, I'll visit you. Our duty, Our duty, our duty your, your, your honour. Your love! As mine to you. Farewell. My father's spirit. 
in arms? All is not well. I doubt some foul play. Would the night were come, till then sit still, my soul. Foul deeds will rise, though all the earth o'erwhelm them to men's eyes. My necessaries are embarked. <laughs> Farewell. <laughs> and, sister, as the winds give benefit and convoy is assistance, do not sleep, but let me hear from you. Do you doubt that? For Hamlet, oh. and the trifling of his favour, hold it a fashion and a toy in blood, a violet in the youth of primy nature, forward, not permanent. Sweet, not lasting. The perfume and suppliance of a minute, no more. No more, but so. Think it no more. For nature crescent does not grow alone in hues and bulk, but as his temper waxes, the inward service of the mind and soul grows wide with all. Perhaps he loves you now, and now no soil nor cautel doth besmirch the virtue of his will. But you must fear... His greatness weighed, his will is not his own, for he himself is subject to his birth. He may not, as unvalued persons do, carve for himself, for on his choice depends the sanity and health of this whole state. Therefore must his choice be circumscribed unto the voice and yielding of that body whereof he is the head. Then, if he says he loves you, it fits your wisdom so far to believe it as he in his particular act and place may give his saying deed, which is no further than the main voice of Denmark goes with all. Then weigh what loss your honour may sustain if with too cradent ear you list his songs or lose your heart or your chaste treasure open to his unmastered importunity. Oh. Now fear it, Ophelia, fear it, my dear sister! And keep within the rear of your affection, out of the shot and danger of desire. The cheriest maid is prodigal enough if she unmask her beauty to the moon. Virtue itself escapes not calumnious strokes. The canker galls the infants of the spring too oft before their buttons be disclosed. And in the morn and liquid dew of youth, contagious blastments are most imminent. Be wary, then. Best safety lies in fear. Youth to itself rebels, though none else near. I shall the effect of this good lesson keep as watchman to my heart. But, good my brother, do not, as some ungracious pastors do, show me the steep and thorny way to heaven, whilst like a puffed and reckless libertine himself, <laughs> the primrose part of dalliance treads and wrecks not his own reed. Oh, fear me not. <laughs> I stay too long. But here my father comes. A, a double blessing is a double grace. <laughs> Occasion smiles upon a second leave. <laughs> yet the earlier it is. Aboard, aboard, for shame. The wind sits in the shoulder of your sail and you have stayed for. There. My blessing with thee. And these few precepts in thy memory, see thou character. Give thy thoughts no tongue, nor any unproportioned thought his act. Mm -hmm. Be thou familiar, but by no means vulgar. The friends thou hast, and their adoption tried, grapple them to thy soul with hoops of steel. But do not dull thy palm with entertainment of each new hatched, unfledged comrade. Beware of entrance to a quarrel, but being in, bear it that the opposed may beware of thee. <laughs> Give every man thine ear, but few thy voice. Take each man's censure, but reserve thy judgment. Costly thy habit, as thy purse can buy, but not expressed in fancy. Rich, not gaudy. For the apparel oft proclaims the man, and they in France of the best rank and station are of a most select and generous chief in that. Neither a borrower nor a lender be, for loan oft loses both itself and friend, and borrowing dulls the edge of husbandry. This above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow, as the night the day, thou canst not then be false to any man. 
Farewell. My blessing season this in thee. Most humbly do I take my leave, my lord. The time invites you. Go, your servants tend. Farewell, Ophelia. And remember well what I have said to you. Tis in my memory locked, and you yourself shall keep the key of it. Oh. Farewell. What is it, Ophelia, he hath said to you? So please you, something touching my lord Hamley. Marry, well be thought. Tis told me he hath very oft of late given private time to you, and you yourself have of your audience been most free and bounteous. If it be so, as so tis put on me, and that in way of caution, I must tell you, you do not understand yourself so clearly as it behoves my daughter and your honour. What is between you? Give me up the truth. He hath, my lord, of late, made many tenders of his affection to me. Affection? Pooh! You speak like a green girl, unsifted in such perilous circumstance. Do you believe his tenders, as you call them? I do not know, my lord, what I should think. Well, Mary, I'll teach you. Think yourself a baby that you obtain his tenders for true pay which are not sterling. Tender yourself more dearly, or... Not to crack the wind of the poor phrase, running it thus, you turned on me a fool. My lord, he hath importuned me with love in honourable fashion. Aye, fashion you may call it, goat, goat. And hath given countenance to his speech, my lord, with almost all the holy vows of heaven. Aye, springes to catch woodcocks. I do know when the blood burns how prodigal the soul lends the tongue vows. These blazes, daughter, giving more light than heat. Extinct in both, even in their promise, as it is a making, you must not take for fire. From this time be somewhat scanter of your maiden presence. Set your entreatments at a higher rate than a command to parley. For Lord Hamlet believes so much in him that he is young, and with a larger terror may he walk than may be given you. In few, Ophelia, do not believe his vows. For they are brokers, not of the dye which their investments show, but mere implorators of unholy suits, breathing like sanctified and pious boards, the better to beguile. This is for all. I would not in plain terms from this time forth have you so slander any moment leisure as to give words or talk with the Lord Hamlet. Look to it, I charge you. Come your ways. I shall obey, my lord. The air bites shrewdly. It is very cold. It is a nipping and an eager air. What hour now? I think it lacks of twelve. No, it is struck. Indeed? I heard it not. And it draws near the season wherein the spirit held his wind to walk. What does this mean, my lord? The king doth wake tonight and takes his rouse, keeps wassail, and the swaggering upspring reels. And as he drains his draughts of Rhenish down, the kettle drum and trumpet thus bray out the triumph of his pledge. Is it a custom? I marryest. But to my mind, though I am native here and to the manner born, it is a custom more honoured in the breach than the observance. This heavy-headed revel, east and west, makes us traduced and taxed of other nations. They clap us drunkards, and with swinish phrase, soil our addition. And indeed it takes from our achievements, though performed at height, the very pith and marrow of our attribute. So oft it chances in particular men, that for some vicious mole of nature in them, as in their birth, wherein they are not guilty, since nature cannot choose his origin, by the all growth of some complexion, oft breaking down the pales and forts of reason, or by some habit that too much or leavens the form of plausive manners, that these men carrying, I say, the stamp of one defect, being nature's livery or fortune star, his virtues else be they as pure as grace, as infinite as man may undergo, shall in the general censure take corruption from that particular fault. The dram of evil doth all the noble substance overdaub to his own scandal. Look, my lord, it comes. Angels and ministers of grace defend us. Be thou 
a spirit of health, or goblin damned, bring with thee airs from heaven or blasts from hell. Be thy intent wicked or charitable, thou comest in such a questionable shape that I will speak to thee. I'll call thee Hamlet, King, Father, Royal Dane, O oh, answer me. Let me not burst in ignorance, but tell why thy canonized bones, hersed in death, have burst their cerements. Why the sepulchre, wherein we saw thee quietly inurned, hath oped his ponderous and marble jaws to cast thee up again. What may this mean, that thou dead corpse again in complete steel revisit past the glimpses of the moon, making night hideous and we fools of nature so horridly to shake our disposition with thoughts beyond the reaches of our souls. Say, why is this? Wherefore? What should we do? It beckons you to go away with it, as if it's some impartment to desire to you alone. With what courteous action it waves you to a more removed ground. But do not go with it. No, by no means. It will not speak. Then I will follow it. Do not, my lord. Why, what should be the fear? I do not set my life at a pin's fee, and for my soul, what can it do to that, being a thing immortal as itself? It waves me forth again. I'll follow it. What if it tempt you toward the flood, my lord? Or to the dreadful summit of the cliff that beetles o'er his base into the sea, and there assume some other horrible form, which might deprive your sovereignty of reason and draw you into madness. <sighs> Think of it! The very place puts toys of desperation without more motive into every brain that looks so many fathoms to the sea and hears it roar beneath. It waves me still. Go on! I'll follow thee! You shall not go, my lord! Hold off your hand! We ruled you shall not go! My Fate cries out and makes these petty artery in this body as hardy as the Nemean lion's nerves. Still am I caught. Unhand me, gentlemen! <laughs> By heaven, I'll make a ghost of him that lets me! I say away! <laughs> Go on! I'll follow thee! He waxes desperate with imagination. Let's follow. Tis not fit thus to obey him. Have after. What is you will this come? Something is rotten in the state of Denmark. Heaven will direct it. Nay, let's follow him. Whither wilt thou lead me? Speak! I'll go no further! Mark me. I will. My hour is almost come, when I to sulfurous and tormenting flames must surrender up myself. Alas, poor ghost! Pity me not, but lend thy serious hearing to what I shall unfold. Speak, I am bound to hear. So art thou to revenge when thou shalt hear. What? I am thy father's spirit, oh. doomed for a certain term to walk the night. And for the day, confined to fast in fires, till the foul crimes done in my days of nature are burnt and purged away. But that I am forbid to tell the secrets of my prison house, I could a tale unfold, whose lightest word would harrow up thy soul, freeze thy young blood, oh. make thy two eyes like stars start from their spheres, oh. thy knotty and combined locks to part, and each particular hair to stand an end, like quills upon the fretful porpentine. But this eternal blazon must not be to ears of flesh and blood. List, list, oh, list. If thou didst ever thy dear father love, Oh, God! Revenge his foul and most unnatural murder. Murder? Murder most foul, as in the best it is, for this most foul, strange, and unnatural. Haste me to know it, that I, with wings as swift as meditation, or the thoughts of love, may sweep to my revenge. I find thee apt, and duller shouldst thou be than the fat weed that roots itself in ease on the leafy wharf, and thou not stir in this. Now, Hamlet, here, tis given out that sleeping in my orchard a serpent stung me, so the whole year of Denmark is by a forged process of my death rankly abused, 
But no, thou noble youth, the serpent that did sting thy father's life, now wears his crown. Oh, my prophetic soul, my uncle. Ay, that incestuous, that adultery beast, with witchcraft of his wit, with traitorous gifts, oh, wicked wit and gifts that have the power so to seduce, one to his shameful lust, the will of my most seeming virtuous queen. No. Oh, Hamlet, what a falling off was there. For me, whose love was of that dignity that it went hand in hand, even with the vow I made to her in marriage, and to decline upon a wretch whose natural gifts were poor to those of me. And virtue, as it never will be moved, the lewdness caught it in a shape of heaven, so lust, though to a radiant angel linked, will sate itself in a celestial bed and prey on garbage. But soft, methinks I scent the morning air. Brief let me be, sleeping within my orchard, my custom always in the afternoon. Upon my secure hour, thy uncle stole with juice of cursed heaven and in a vial, and in the porches of mine ears did pour the leprous distillment whose effect holds such an enmity with blood of man that swift as quicksilver it courses through the natural gates and alleys of the body, and with a sudden vigour it doth toss it and curge like eager droppings into milk of thin and wholesome blood. So did it not. And the most instant tetter barked about, most leather-like with vile and loathsome crust, all my smooth body... Thus was I sleeping by a brother's hand of life, of crown, of queen, at once dispatched, cut off even in the blossoms of my sin, unhouseled, disappointed, unannealed, no reckoning made, but sent to my account with all my imperfections on my head. Oh, horrible, oh, horrible. Most horrible. If thou hast nature in thee, bear it not. <laughs> Let not the royal bed of Denmark be a couch for luxury and damned incest. But howsoever thou pursuest this act, taint not thy mind, nor let thy soul contrive against thy mother aught. Leave her to heaven and to those thorns that in her bosom lodge to prick and sting her. Fare thee well at once. What? The glow-worm shows the matin to be near and begins to pale his uneffectual fires. Adieu, adieu, Hamlet, remember me. Oh, all you host of the heavens, oh, earth, what else? And shall I couple hell, oh, fire, hold, hold my heart? And you, my sinews, grow not instant old, but bear me stiffly up. Remember thee, I, thou poor ghost, whilst memory holds a seat in this distracted globe. Remember thee? Yea, from the table of my memory I'll wipe away all trivial fond records, all sores of books, all forms, all precious past that youth and observation copied there, and thy commandment all alone shall live within the book and volume of my brain, unmixed with baser matter. Yes, by heaven. O most pernicious woman, O villain, villain, smiling, dominant villain, my tables, my tables, neat it is, I set it down, that one may smile and smile and be a villain. At least I am sure it may be so in Denmark. So, uncle, there you are. Now to my word, it is adieu, adieu, 
remember me? I have sworn. My lord! My lord! My lord! Lord Hamlet! Heaven secure him! So be it. Hello! Oh! My lord! Hello! Oh! Oh! Boy! Come back! Come! Oh, this is my noble lord. What news, my lord? Oh, wonderful. Good, my lord. Tell it. No, you will reveal it. Not I, my lord. By heaven. Not I, my lord. How say you then? Would heart of man once think it... But you'll be secret. Aye, by heaven, my heaven, lord. Mother. There's ne'er a villain dwelling in all Denmark, but he's an arrant knave. There needs no ghost, my lord, come from the grave to tell us this. Why, right, you would have the right. And so, without more circumstance at all, I hold it fit that we shake hands and part. You as your business and desire shall point you, for every man hath business and desire, such as it is. And for my own poor part, look you, I'll go pray. These are but wild and whirling words, my lord. I'm sorry they offend you heartily. Yes, faith heartily. There's no offence, my lord. Yes, by St. Patrick, but there is Horatio... And much offence, too. Touching this vision here, it is an honest ghost, that let me tell you. For your desire to know what is between us, or master it as you may. Uh, and now, good friends, as you are friends, scholars and soldiers, give me one poor request. What is, my lord? We will. Never make known what you have seen tonight. My lord? We will not. Nay, but swear it. In faith, my lord, not I. Nor I, my lord, in faith. <laughs> Upon my sword. We have sworn, my lord, already. Indeed, upon my sword, indeed. Swear. Ah, ah, boy, sayest thou so? Art thou there, true penny? Come on, you hear this fellow in the cellarage? Consent to swear. Propose the oath, my lord. Never to speak of this that you have seen. Swear by my sword. Swear. We swear. We swear. Hick. Et ubique, <laughs> then we'll shift our ground. Come hither, gentlemen, and lay your hands again upon my sword. Never to speak of this that you have heard. Swear by my sword. Swear by his sword. We swear. We swear. Ah, well said, old mole. Canst work in the earth so fast. A worthy pioneer. Once more, remove, good friends. Oh, day and night. But this is wondrous strange. And therefore, as a stranger, give it welcome. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in our philosophy. <laughs> but come here as before. Never so help you mercy. How strange or odd so e'er I bear myself, as I perchance hereafter shall think meet to put an antic disposition on, that you, at such time seeing me, never shall, with arms encumbered thus or thus head shaked, or by pronouncing of some doubtful phrase, as well we know, or we could, and if we would, or if we list to speak, or they be, and if they might, or such ambiguous giving out to note that you know aught of me, this not to do, so grace and mercy at your most need help you swear. Swear. We swear! Rest, rest, perturbed spirit. So, gentlemen, with all my love I do commend me to you. And what so poor a man as Hamlet is may do to express his love and friending to you, God willing, shall not lack. Let us go in together. And still, your fingers on your lips, I pray. The time is out of joint. Oh, cursed spite. That ever I was born to set it right. <gasps> Nay. Come. Let's go together. Give him this money and these notes, Ronaldo. I will, my lord. You shall do marvellous wisely, good Ronaldo, before you visit him to make inquiry of his behaviour. My lord, I did intend it. Very well said, very well said. Look you, sir. Inquire me first what danskers are in Paris, and how and who, what means and where they keep, what company, at what expense, and finding by this encompassment and drift of question that they do know my son, come you more nearer than your particular demands will touch it, take you as twere some distant knowledge of him. As thus, I know his father and his friends, and in part him, 
You mark this Ronaldo? Aye, very well, my lord. And in part him, but, you may say, not well. But if be he I mean, he's very wild, addicted, so-and-so, and, -so, and there put on him what forgeries you please. Marry, none so rank as may dishonour him, take heed of that, but, sir, such wanton, wild, and usual slips as our companions noted and most known to youth and liberty. As gaming, my lord. Aye, or drinking, fencing, swearing, quarrelling, drabbing, you may go so far. Oh, my lord, that would dishonour him. First, no, as you may season it in the charge. You must not put another scandal on him that he is open to incontinency, that's not my meaning, but breathe his faults so quaintly that they may seem the taints of liberty, the flash and outbreak of a fiery mind, a savageness in unreclaimed blood of general assault. But, my good lord... Wherefore should you do this? I, my lord, I would know that. Marry, sir, here's my drift, and I believe it is a fetch of warrant. You laying these slight sullies on my son, as twere a thing a little soiled i' the working, mark you your party in converse, him you would sound, having ever seen in the predominate crimes the youth you breathe of guilty, be assured he closes with you in this consequence, good sir, or so, or friend, or gentleman, according to the phrase and the addition of man and country. Very good, my lord. And then, sir, does he this... He does. What was I about to say? Oh, by the mass, I was about to say something. Where did I leave? At uh, closes in the consequence, at friend or so, and gentleman. At, at closes in the consequence, I marry. He closes with you thus. I know the gentleman. I saw him yesterday, or what other day, or then, or then, with such and such, and as you say, there was he gaming, there or took his rouse, there falling out at tennis, or perchance I saw him enter such a house of sale, videli set a brothel, or so forth. See you now. Your bait of falsehood takes this cup of truth. And thus do we, of wisdom and of reach, with windlasses and with assays of bias, by indirections, find directions out. So, by my former lecture and advice, shall you, my son. You have me, have you not? My lord, I have. God by you, fare you well. Good, my lord. Observe his inclination in yourself. I shall, my lord. And let him ply his music. Uh, well, my lord. Farewell. Oh, now, Ophelia. What's the matter? Alas, my lord, I have been so frighted. Uh, with what in the name of God? My lord, as I was sewing in my chamber, Lord Hamlet, with his doublet all embraced, no hat upon his head, his stockings fouled, unguarded and down jiveted to his ankle, pale as his shirt, his knees knocking each other, and with a look... So piteous in purport, as if he had been lucid out of hell to speak of horrors, he comes before me. What, mad for thy love? My lord, I do not know, but truly I do fear it. What said he? He, he took me by the wrist and held me hard. Then goes he to the length of all his arm, and with his other hand thus o'er his brow. He falls to such perusal of my face as he would draw it. <sighs> Long stayed he so. At last, a little shaking of mine arm, and thrice his head, thus waving up and down, he raised a sigh so piteous and profound that it did seem to shatter all his bulk and end his being. Oh! That done, he lets me go, and with his head over his shoulder turned, he seemed to find his way without his eyes, for out of doors he went without their help, and to the last bended their light on me. Come, go with me. I will go seek the king. This is the very ecstasy of love, whose violent property foredoes itself, and leads the will to desperate undertakings as oft as any passion under heaven that does afflict our natures. I am sorry. Have you given him any hard words of late? No, my good lord, but as you did command, I did repel his letters and denied his access to me. That hath made him mad. I am sorry that with better speed and judgment I had not coated him. I feared he did but trifle and meant to wreck thee. 
But beshrew my jealousy. For by heaven it is as proper to our age to cast beyond ourselves in our opinions as it is common for the younger sort to lack discretion. Come, go we to the king. This must be known, which being kept close might move more grief to hide than hate to utter love. Welcome, dear Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. My lord. Moreover, that we much did long to see you, the need we have to use you did provoke our hasty sending. Something have you heard of Hamlet's transformation, so I call it, if nor the exterior nor the inward man resembles that it was? In what it should be, more than his father's death, that thus hath put him so much on the understanding of himself, I cannot dream of. I entreat you both, that being of so young days brought up with him, and since so neighboured to his youth and humour, that you vouchsafe your rest here in our court some little time, so by your companies to draw him on to pleasure, and to gather so much as from occasion you may glean, whether aught to us unknown afflicts him thus, that opened lies within our remedy. Good gentlemen, he hath much talked of you, and sure I am to men that are not living to whom he more I please. If it will please you to show us so much gentry and goodwill as to expend your time with us a while for the supply and profit of our hope, your visitation shall receive such thanks as fits a king's remembrance. Both your majesties might, by the sovereign power you have of us, put your dread pleasures more into command than to entreaty. But we both obey and here give up ourselves in the full bent to lay our service freely at your feet, to be commanded. Thanks, Rosencrantz and gentle Guildenstern. Thanks, Guildenstern and gentle Rosencrantz. <laughs> and I beseech you instantly to visit my too much changed son. Go, some of you, and bring these gentlemen where Hamlet is. Heavens, make our presence and our practices pleasant and helpful to him. Aye. Amen. The ambassador from Norway, my good lord, are joyfully returned. Thou still hast been the father of good news. Have I, my lord? I assure you, my good liege, I hold my duty as I hold my soul, both to my god and to my gracious king. And I do think, or else this brain of mine hunts not the trail of policy so sure as it hath used to do, that I have found the very cause of Hamlet's lunacy. Oh, speak of that. That do I long to hear. Give first admittance to the ambassadors. My news shall be the fruit to that great feast. And thyself do grace to them and bring them in. My lord. He tells me, my sweet queen, that he hath found the head and source of all your son's distemper. I doubt it is no other but the maid, his father's death, and our or hasty that. Well, we shall sift him. <laughs> Welcome, good friends. My lord. My lord. Say, Voltamand, what from our brother, Norway? Most fair return of greetings and desire. Upon our first he sent out to suppress his nephew's levies, which to him appeared to be a preparation against the Polak, but better looked into, he truly found it was against your highness. Whereat grieved that so his sickness, age, and impotence was falsely borne in hand, sends out arrests on Fort Embrass, which he, in brief, obeys, receives rebuke from Norway, and, in fine, makes vow before his uncle never more to give the essay of arms against your majesty, whereon old Norway, overcome with joy, gives him three thousand crowns in annual fee, and his commission to employ those soldiers, so levied as before, against the Polak, with an entreaty, herein further shown, that it might please you to give quiet pass through your dominions for his enterprise, on such regards of safety and allowance as therein are set down. It likes us well. Then at our more considered time, we'll read, answer, and think upon this business. Meantime, we thank you for your well-took labour. Go to your rest. At night, we'll feast together. <laughs> Most welcome home. My, my lord. lord. <laughs> this business is very well ended. <clears throat> my liege and madam, to expostulate what majesty should be, what duty is, why day is day, night night, and time is time, were nothing but to waste night day and time. Therefore, 
since brevity is the soul of wit, and tediousness the limbs and outward flourishes, I will be brief. Your noble son is mad. Mad call I it, for to define true madness what is to be nothing else but mad. But let that go. More matter with less art. Madam, I swear I use no art at all. That he is mad, tis true. Tis true, tis pity. And pity tis, tis true. A foolish figure. But farewell it, for I will use no art. Mad, let us grant him then, and now remains that we find out the cause of this effect. Or rather say the cause of this defect, for this effect effective comes by cause. Thus it remains, and the remainder thus. Perpend. I have a daughter, have whilst she is mine, who in her duty and obedience mark hath given me this. Now gather and surmise. To the celestial and my soul's idol, the most beautified Ophelia. That's a new phrase, vile phrase. Beautified is a vile phrase. But you shall hear. These, in her excellent white bosom, these, etc. Came this from Hamlet to her? Good madam, stay a while. I will be faithful. Doubt thou the stars are fire. Doubt that the sun doth move. Doubt truth to be a liar, but never doubt I love. Oh, dear Ophelia, I am ill at these numbers. I have not art to reckon my groans, but that I love thee best. Oh, most best, believe it, adieu. Thine evermore most dear lady, whilst this machine is to him, Hamlet. This in obedience hath my daughter showed me, and more above hath his solicitings, as they fell out by time, by means, and place, all given to mine ear. But how hath she received his love? What do you think of me? As of a man faithful and honourable. I would fain prove so. But what might you think? When I had seen this hot love on the wing, as I perceived it, I must tell you that before my daughter told me what might you, or my dear majesty, your queen here, think, if I had played the desk or table book, or given my heart a winking, mute and dumb, or looked upon this love with idle sight, what might you think? No, I went round to work, and my young mistress thus I did bespeak. Lord Hamlet is a prince out of thy star. This must not be. And then I precepts gave her that she should lock herself from his resort, admit no messengers, receive no tokens, which done, she took the fruits of my advice, and he, repulsed, a short tale to make, fell into a sadness, then into a fast, thence to a watch, thence into a weakness, thence to a lightness, and by this declension into the madness wherein now he raves and all we wail for. Do you think tis this? It may be. Very like. Hath there been such a time, I'd fain know that, that I have positively said tis so when it proved otherwise? Not that I know. Take this from this, if this be otherwise. If circumstances lead me, I will find where truth is hid, though it were hid indeed within the centre. How may we try it further? You know, sometimes he walks four hours together here in the lobby. So he does indeed. At such a time, I'll loose my daughter to him. My lord, be you and I behind an arras, then mark the encounter. If he love her not, and be not from his reason fallen thereon, let me be no assistant for a state, but keep a farm and carters. We will try it. But look. Where sadly the poor wretch comes reading. Away, I do beseech you, both away. I'll board him presently. Oh, give me leave. Very, very well. Come. How does my good Lord Hamlet? Well, God a mercy. You know me, my lord. Excellent well. You are a fishmonger. Not I, my lord. Then I would you were so honest a man. Honest, my lord? I, sir, to be honest as this world goes, is to be one man picked out of ten thousand. <laughs> That's very true, my lord. Mm, for if the sun breed maggots in a dead dog, being a good kissing carrion, have you a daughter? I have, my lord. Let her not walk ere the sun. Conception is a blessing, but not as your daughter may conceive. <laughs> Friend, look to it. How say you by that? Still harping on my daughter. Yet he knew me not at first. 
He said I was a fishmonger. He is far gone, far gone. And truly, in my youth, I suffered much extremity for love. Very near this. I'll speak to him again. What do you read, my lord? Words. Words, words. What is the matter, my lord? It, between who? I mean the matter you read, my lord. Slander, sir, for the satirical rogue says here that old men have grey beards, that their faces are wrinkled, their eyes purging thick amber or plum tree gum, and that they have a plentiful lack of wit, together with most weak hands, all which, sir, though I most powerfully and potently believe, yet I hold it not honestly to have it thus set down. For you yourself, sir, should be old as I am, if like a crab you could go backward. Though this be madness, yet there is method in it. Will you walk out of the air, my lord? Into my grave? Indeed, that is out of the air. How pregnant sometimes his replies are. A happiness that often madness hits on, which reason and sanity could not so prosperously be delivered of. I will leave him, and suddenly contrive the means of meeting between him and my daughter. My honourable lord, I will most humbly take my leave of you. You cannot, sir, take from me anything that I would more willingly part with all. Except my life. Except my life. Except my life. Say you well, my lord. These tedious old fools. Ah, you go to seek the Lord Hamlet? There he is. God save you, sir. My honoured lord. Uh, my most dear lord. My excellent good <laughs> friends, how dost thou gild and stand? <laughs> oh, Rosen, grand good lads, how do you both? As the indifferent children of the earth? Happy <laughs> in that we are not over, happy. <laughs> On fortune's cap, we are not the very button. Well, nor the soles of her shoe. <laughs> Neither, my lord. <laughs> then you live about her waist or in the middle of her favours, eh? Faith, her private suite. Oh, in the <laughs> secret parts of fortune. <laughs> oh, most true, she is a strumpet. What's the news? None, my lord, but that the world's grown honest. Uh, then is doomsday near, but your news is not true. Let me question more in particular. What have you, my good friends? Deserved at the hands of fortune that she sends you to prison hither. Prison, my lord. Denmark's a prison. <laughs> then is the world one. <laughs> a goodly one in which there are many confines, wards and dungeons. Denmark being one of the worst. We think not so, my lord. Why then, tis none to you. For there is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. To me, it is a prison. Why, then, your ambition makes it one. <laughs> it is too narrow for your mind. Oh, God, I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space. Were it not that I have bad dreams? Which dreams are, indeed, ambition? For the very substance of the ambitious is merely the shadow of a dream. <laughs> a dream itself is but a shadow. <laughs> Truly. And I hold ambition of so airy and light a quality that it is but a shadow's shadow. <laughs> <laughs> then are our beggars' bodies and our monarchs and outstretched heroes the beggars' shadows. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we to the court, for by my faith I cannot reason. We'll, we'll wait, wait upon, upon you. you. No such matter. I will not sort you with the rest of my servants. For, to speak to you like an honest man, I am most dreadfully attended. But in the beaten way of friendship, what make you at Elsinore? Well, to visit you, my lord. No other occasion. <laughs> Beggar that I am. I am even poor in thanks, but I thank you, and sure, dear friends, my thanks are too dear to hate me. Were you not sent for? Mm -hmm. Is it your own inclining? Is it a free visitation? Come, deal justly with me. Come, come, next, speak. What should we say, my lord? Why, anything but the purpose. You were sent for, and there is a kind of confession in your looks which your modesties have not craft enough to colour. I know the good king and queen have sent for you. T to what end, my lord? That you must teach me. But let me conjure you by the rights of our fellowship, by the consonancy of our youth, by the obligation of our ever-preserved love, and by what more dear a better proposer could charge you with all, be even and direct with me, whether you were sent for or no. St. Guildenstern. May then I have an eye of you. If you love me, hold not off. My lord. We were sent for. I will tell you why. 
So shall my anticipation prevent your discovery and your secrecy to the king and queen moat no feather. I have of late, but wherefore I know not, lost all my mirth, foregone all custom of exercise, and indeed it goes so heavily with my disposition that this goodly frame, the earth, seems to me a sterile promontory. This most excellent canopy, the air, look you, this brave or hanging firmament, this majestical roof fretted with golden fire, why, it appears no other thing to me than a foul and pestilent congregation of vapours. What a piece of work is a man! How noble in reason! How infinite in faculty! In form and moving, how express and admirable! In action, how like an angel! In apprehension, how like a god! The beauty of the world! The paragon of animals! And yet to me, what is this quintessence of dust? Man delights not me. <laughs> No, nor woman neither, though by your smiling you seem to say so. Oh, my lord, there was no such stuff in my thoughts. Why did you laugh then when I said man delights not me? Oh, to think, my lord, if you delight not in man, what Lenten entertainment the players shall receive from you. What? We coated them on the way, and hither are they coming to offer you service. But he that plays the king shall be welcome. His majesty shall have tribute of me. <laughs> the adventurous knight shall use his foil and target. <laughs> the lover shall not sigh gratis. The humorous man shall end his part in peace. The clown shall make those laugh whose lungs are tickled to the seer, and the lady shall say her mind freely, or the blank verse shall halt for it. <laughs> what players are they? Even those you are wont to take delight in, the tragedians of the city. How oh, chances it they travel? Their residence, both in reputation and profit, was better both ways. I think their inhibition comes by the means of the late innovation. Uh, do they hold the same estimation they did when I was in the city? Are they so followed? No, indeed they are not. Uh, how comes it? Do they grow rusty? Hey, their endeavour keeps in the wonted pace. But there is, sir, an eerie of children, little aasses that cry out on the top of question and are most tyrannically clapped for it. These are now the fashion, <laughs> and so berattle the common stages, so they call them, that many wearing rapiers are afraid of goose quills and dare scarce come thither. What are they children? Who maintains them? How are they escorted? Will they pursue the quality no longer than they can sing? Will they not say afterwards, if they should grow themselves the common players, as it is most like if their means are not better, their writers do them wrong to make them exclaim against their own succession? Mm, faith, there's been much to do on both sides, and the nation holds it no sin to tar them into controversy. There was, for a while, no money bid for argument unless the poet and the player went to cuffs in the question. Uh, is it possible? Oh, there has been much thrilling about of brains. Uh, do the boys carry it away? Aye, that they do, my lord. Hercules and his load, too. Uh, <laughs> it is not strange, for my uncle is king of Denmark. Hmm. And those that would make mouths at him while my father lived give twenty, forty, fifty, a hundred ducats apiece for his picture in little. Splad, there is something in this more than natural, if philosophy could find it out. There are the players. Gentlemen, you are welcome to Elsinore. Your hands, come. The appurtenance of welcome is fashion and ceremony. Let me comply with you in this garb, lest my extent to the players, which I tell you must show fairly outward, should more appear like entertainment than yours. You are welcome. <laughs> but my uncle, father, and aunt, mother are deceived. In what, my dear lord? I am but mad. North, northwest. When the wind is southerly, I know a hook from a hand saw. We'll be with you, gentlemen. Hark you, Guildenstern, and you too. At each ear a hearer, that great baby you see there is not yet out of his swaddling clouds. <laughs> Please, the second time comes to them. They say an old man is twice a child. <laughs> I will <laughs> prophesy he comes to tell me in the player's market. Uh, you say right, sir. Uh, uh, Monday morning, I, you talk uh, so indeed. My lord, I have news to tell you. My lord, I have news to tell you. When the Roscius was an actor in Rome... The actor to come hither, my lord. Buzz, buzz. Upon my honour. Then came each actor on his ass. The best actors in the world. Either for tragedy, comedy, history, pastoral, pastoral comical, historical pastoral, tragical historical, 
tragical, comical, historical, pastoral. <laughs> Scene, individable, or poem unlimited. Seneca cannot be too heavy, nor Plautus too light. <laughs> For the law of writ and the liberty, these are the only men. Oh, Jeff, the judge of Israel, what a treasure hadst thou. What treasure had he, my lord? Why, one fair daughter and no more. <laughs> the which he loved passing well. Still on my daughter. Am I not in the right, old Jephthah? If you call me Jephthah, my lord, I have a daughter that I love passing well. Nay, that follows not. What follows then, my lord? Why, as by lot, God what? And then you know it came to pass as most like it was. The first row of the pious chanson will show you more. For look where my abridgments come! You welcome, masters, welcome all. Uh, I am glad to see thee well. Welcome, good friends. Oh, my old friend, thy face uh, is balanced since I saw thee last. Comes thou to beard me in Denmark. <laughs> what, my young lady and mistress? By our lady, your ladyship is nearer heaven than when I saw you last by the altitude of a chopin. <laughs> Pray God your voice, like a piece of uncurrent gold, be not cracked within the ring. Oh. Masters, you are all welcome. Uh, we'll ee into it, like French falconers. Fly at anything we see. We'll have a speech straight. Come, uh, give us a taste of your quality. Uh, Come, a passionate speech. Uh, what speech, my good lord? I heard thee speak me a speech once, but it was never acted, or if it was not above once, for the play I remember pleased not the million. T'was a caviare to the general. But it was, as I received it, and others whose judgments in such matters cried in the top of mine, an excellent play. Well digested in the scenes, set down with as much modesty as cunning. I remember one said there were no salads in the lines to make the matter savoury, nor no matter in the phrase that might indict the author of affectation, but called it an honest method, as wholesome as sweet, and by very much more handsome than fine. One speech in it I chiefly loved. "'Twas Aeneas' tale to Dido, and thereabout of it, especially where he speaks of Priam's slaughter. Ah. Yeah, if it live in your memory, begin at this line. Let me see. Uh, let me see. Uh, the, the rugged Pyrrhus, like the Hyrcanian beast. Uh, it, it is not so. It begins with Pyrrhus. Uh, the rugged Pyrrhus... He whose sable arms, black as his purpose, did the knight resemble when he lay couched in the ominous horse, that now this red and black complexion smeared with heraldry more dismal. Head to foot now is he total ghouls, horridly tricked with blood of fathers, mothers, daughters, sons, baked and impasted with the parching streets that lend a tyrannous and damned light to their vile murders, roasted in wrath and fire, and thus orsized with coagulate gore, with eyes like carbuncles, the hellish pyrrhus, old grandsire Priam <laughs> So proceed you. For God, my lord, well spoken and with good accent and good discretion. And on he finds him, striking too short at Greeks. His antique sword, rebellious to his arms, lies where it falls, repugnant to command. Unequal match, Pyrrhus at Priam drives, in rage strikes wide, but with the whiff and wind of his fell sword, the unnerved father falls. Then senseless Ilium, seeming to feel this blow with flaming top, stoops to his base and with a hideous crash takes prisoner Pyrrhus' ear. For lo, his sword, which was declining on the milky head of reverend Priam, seemed in the air to stick. So, as a painted tyrant, Pyrrhus stood, and like a neutral to his will and matter, did nothing. But as we often see against some storm, a silence in the heavens, the rack stands still, the bold wind speechless, and the orb below as hush as death, and on the dreadful thunder doth rend the region. So, after Pyrrhus' pause, a roused vengeance sets him new a work, and never did the Cyclops' hammers fall on Mars, his armour, forged for proof he turned with less remorse than Pyrrhus' bleeding sword now falls on prior. Out, 
Out thou trumpet fortune, all you gods in general synod, take away her power, break all the spokes and bellies from her wheel, and bowl the round knave down the hill of heaven, as low as to the fiend. This is too long. It shall to the barbers with your beard. Uh, prithee, say on. He's for a jig or a tale of bawdry, or he sleeps. Say on. Come to Hecuba. But who, oh, who had seen the Mobled Queen? The Mobled Queen. That's good. Mobled Queen is good. Run barefoot up and down, threatening the flames with bison rule. A clout upon that head where late the diadem stood, and for a robe about her lank and all her timid loins, a blanket in the alarm of fear caught up. Who this had seen, with tongue in venom steep gainst fortune's state, would treason have pronounced. But if the gods themselves did see her then, when she saw Pyrrhus make malicious sport in mincing with his sword her husband's limbs, the instant burst of clamour that she made, unless things mortal moved them not at all, would have made milk the burning eyes of heaven and passion in the gods. <laughs> Look where he has not turned his colour and his tears in his eyes. Pray you no more. Tis well. I'll... Have thee speak out the rest soon. Good my lord, will you see the players well bestowed? You here let them be well used, for they are the abstracts and brief chronicles of the time. <laughs> After your death you were better have a bad epitaph than their ill report while you live. And my lord, I will use them according to their deserts. God's bodkin, man, much better. Use every man after his desert, and who shall scape whipping? Use them after your own honour and dignity. The less they deserve, the more merit is in your bounty. Take them in. Come, sirs. Follow him, friends. We'll hear a play tomorrow. <laughs> Dost thou hear me, old friend? Uh -huh. Can you play the murder of Gonzago? Yeah, I am. We'll have tomorrow night. You could, for a needs, study a speech of some dozen or sixteen lines which I would set down and insert in it, could you not? Aye, my lord. Very well. Follow that lord, and look you, mm. mock him not. <laughs> Aye, my lord. My good friends, I'll leave you till night. You are welcome to Elsinore. Good, my lord. Aye, so. God by you. Now I am alone. Oh. What a rogue and peasant slave am I. Is it not monstrous that this player here, but in a fiction, in a dream of passion, could force his soul so to his whole conceit, that from her working all his visage wand, tears in his eyes, distraction in his aspect, a broken voice, and his whole function suiting with forms to his conceit, and all for nothing? A Hecuba? What's Hecuba to him or he to Hecuba that he should weep for her? What would he do had he the motive and the cue for passion that I have? He would drown the stage with tears, and cleave the general ear with horrid speech, make mad the guilty and appall the free, confound the ignorant and amaze indeed the very faculty of eyes and ears. Yet I... A dull and muddy metal rascal peak, like John a-dreams, unpregnant of my cause, and can say nothing. No, not for a king, upon whose property and most dear life a damned defeat was made. Am I a coward? Who calls me villain, breaks my pate across, plucks off my beard and blows it in my face, tweaks me by the nose, gives me the lie, the throat as deep as to the lungs. Who does me this, huh? Swoons, I should take it, for it cannot be, but I am pigeon-livered, and lack gall to make oppression bitter, or ere this I would have fatted all the region kites with this slave's awful, bloody, bawdy villain, remorseless, treacherous, lecherous, kindless villain! Oh! Oh, vengeance! <gasps> oh.
Why? What an ass am I? I sure this is most brave, that I, the son of a dear father murdered, prompted to my revenge by heaven and hell, must like a whore unpack my heart with words and fall a-cursing like a very drab, a scullion, firebont, foe, about my brain. Huh. I have heard that guilty creatures sitting at a play have, by the very cunning of the scene, been struck so to the soul that presently they have proclaimed their malefactions for murder, though it have no tongue, will speak with most miraculous organ. I'll have these players play something like the murder of my father before mine uncle. I'll observe his looks. I'll tent him to the quick. If he but blench, I know my course. The spirit that I have seen may be the devil, and the devil hath power to assume a pleasing shape, yea, and perhaps out of my weakness and my melancholy, as he is very potent with such spirits, abuses me to damn me. I'll have grounds more relative than this. The play is the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. And can you, by no drift of circumstance, get from him why he puts on his confusion, grating so harshly all his days of quiet with turbulent and dangerous lunacy? He does confess he feels himself distracted, but from what cause he will by no means speak. Nor do we find him forward to be sounded, but with a crafty madness keeps aloof when we would bring him on to some confession of his true state. Did he receive you well? Oh, most like a gentleman. But with much forcing of his disposition. Well, uh, niggard of question, but of our demands most free in his reply. Did you assay him to any pastimes? Oh, madam, it so fell out that certain players we all wrought on the way. Of these we told him, and there did seem in him a kind of joy to hear of it. They are here about the court, and, as I think, they have already ordered this night to play before him. It is most true, and he beseeched me to entreat your majesties to hear and see the matter. With all my heart, and it doth much content me to hear him so inclined. Good gentlemen, give him a further edge, and drive his purpose on to these delights. He shall, my lord. <laughs> Sweet Gertrude, leave us too, for we have closely sent for Hamlet hither, that he, as twere by accident, may hear a point of Ophelia. Her father and myself, lawful as files, will so bestow ourselves that, seeing unseen, we may have their encounter frankly judge, and gather by him, as he is behaved, if be the affliction of his love, or no, that thus he suffers for it. I shall obey you. And for your part, Ophelia, I do wish that your good beauties be the happy cause of Hamlet's wildness. So shall I hope your virtues will bring him to his wonted way again. To both your honours. Madam, I wish it may. Ophelia, walk you here. Gracious, so please you, we will bestow ourselves. Read on this book that show of such an exercise may colour your loneliness. We are off to blame in this. It is too much proved that with devotion's visage and pious action, we do sugar o'er the devil himself. Oh, tis too true. How oh, smart a lash that speech doth give my conscience. The harlot's cheek, beauted with plastering art, is not more ugly to the thing that helps it than is my deed to my most painted word. Oh, heavy bird. I hear him coming. Let's withdraw, my lord. Be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles, and by opposing end them. To die, to sleep, no more, and by a sleep to say we end, the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished. To die, to sleep, 
to sleep. The chance to dream. Aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. <laughs> there's the respect that makes calamity of so long life, for who would bear the whips and scorns of time? The oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of disprized love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes, when he himself might his quietus make with a bare bodkin. Who would fardels bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life, but that the dread of something after death? The undiscovered country from whose born no traveller returns puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. Thus conscience doth make cowards of us all, and thus the native hue of resolution is sickly at all with the pale cast of thought, and enterprises of great pith and moment, with this regard, their currents turn awry, and lose the name of action. Soft you now. The fair Ophelia. Nymph, in thy orisons, be all my sins remembered. Good, my lord. How does your honour for this many a day? I humbly thank you. Well, well, well. My lord, I have remembrances of yours that I have longed long to re-deliver. I pray you now receive them. No. No, not I. I never gave you aught. My honoured lord, you know right well you did. And with them words of so sweet breath composed as made the things more rich. Mm. Their perfume lost, take these again. For to the noble mind rich gifts wax mm. poor when givers prove unkind. There, my lord. Huh? Huh? Are you honest? My lord? Are you fair? What means, your lordship? That if you be honest and fair, your honesty should admit no discourse to your beauty. Could beauty, my lord, have better commerce than with honesty? Aye, truly, for the power of beauty will sooner transform honesty from what it is to a board than the force of honesty can translate beauty into his likeness. This was sometime a paradox, but now the time gives it proof. I did love you once. Indeed, my lord. You made me believe so. You should not have believed me. For virtue cannot so inoculate our old stock, but we shall relish of it. I loved you not. I was the more deceived. <laughs> Get thee to a nunnery. Why wouldst thou be a breeder of sinners? I am myself indifferent, honest, but yet I could accuse me of such things that it were better my mother had not borne me. I am very... Proud, revengeful, ambitious, with more offences at my back than I have thoughts to put them in imagination to give them shape or time to act them in. What should such fellows as I do, crawling between heaven and earth? We are arrant knaves all. Believe none of us. Go thy ways to a nunnery. Where's your father? Oh, my lord. Huh? Well, <laughs> let the doors be shut upon him, that he may play the fool nowhere but in his own house. Farewell. Sweet heavens. <laughs> if thou dost marry, I'll give thee this plague for thy dowry. Be thou as chaste as ice, as pure as snow, thou shalt not scape calumny. Get thee to a nunnery. Go. Farewell. Or if thou wilt needs marry, marry a fool. For wise men know well enough what monsters you make of them. To a nunnery. Go. And quickly, too. Farewell. I was restored. I have heard of your paintings too well enough. God has given you one face and you make yourselves another. You jig, you amble. And you lisp and nickname God's creatures and make your wantonness your ignorance. 
go to a low warrant. It has made me mad. I say we will have no more marriages. <laughs> Those that are married already, all but one, shall live. The rest shall keep as they are. To a nunnery. Go! <laughs> What noble mind is here overthrown? The courteous, soldiers, scholars, eye, tongue, sword, the expectancy and rose of the fair state, the glass of fashion and the mould of form, the observed of all observers, quite, quite down. And I... Of ladies most deject and wretched, that sucked the honey of his music vows, now see that noble and most sovereign reason, like sweet bells jangled out of tune and harsh, that unmatched form and feature of blown youth blasted with ecstasy. Oh, woe is me! I have seen what I have seen. See what I see. <laughs> oh, love? His affections do not that way tend. Nor what he spake, though it lacked form a little, was not like madness. There's something in his soul, or which his melancholy sits on brood. And I do doubt the hatch and the disclose will be some danger, which for to prevent, I have in quick determination thus set it down. He shall with speed to England for the demand of our neglected tribute. Haply the seas and countries different with variable objects shall expel this something settled matter in his heart, whereon his brain still beating puts him thus from fashion of himself. What think you on? It shall do well, but yet do I believe the origin and commencement of this grief sprang from neglected love. Ah. Oh, no, Ophelia. You need not tell us what Lord Hamlet said. We've heard it all. My lord, do as you please. But if you hold it fit, after the play, let his queen mother all alone entreat him to show his griefs. Let her be round with him, and I'll be placed, so please you, in the ear of all their conference. If she find him not, to England send him, or confine him where your wisdom best shall think. It shall be so. Madness in great ones must not unwatched go. <laughs> Speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you, trippingly on the tongue. But if you mouth it, as many of your players do, I had as lief the town crier had spoke my lines. <laughs> Nor do not saw the air too much with your hand, thus, but use all gently. For in the very torrent, tempest, and as I may say, whirlwind of your passion, you must acquire and beget a temperance that may give it smoothness. Mm -hmm. Oh, it offends me to the soul to hear a robustious, periwig-pated fellow tear a passion to tatters, mm -hmm. to very rags, to split the ears of the groundlings, who for the most part are capable of nothing but inexplicable dumb shows and noise. <laughs> I would have such a fellow whipped for or doing termagant. It out Herod's Herod. <laughs> Pray you avoid it. I warrant, Your Honour. You be not too tame neither, but let your own discretion be your tutor. Suit the action to the word, the word to the action, with this special observance, that you o'erstep not the modesty of nature, for anything so overdone is from the purpose of playing, whose end, both at the first and now, was and is to hold as t'were the mirror up to nature, to show virtue her own feature, scorn her own image, the very age and body of the time, his form and pressure. 
Now this overdone, or come tardy off, though it makes the unskilful laugh, cannot but make the judicious grieve. The censure of the which one must in your allowance or weigh a whole theatre of others. <laughs> oh, there be players that I have seen play, and heard others praise, and that highly, not to speak it profanely, <laughs> that neither having the accent of Christians, nor the gait of Christian, pagan, nor no man, have so <laughs> strutted and bellowed that I have thought some of nature's journeymen had made men, and not made them well. They imitated humanity so abominably. I hope we have reformed that indifferently with us, sir. Oh, reform it altogether. And let those that play your clowns speak no more than is set down for them. <laughs> for there be of them that will themselves laugh to set on some quantity of barren spectators to laugh too, though in the meantime some necessary question of the play be then to be considered. That's villainous, and shows a most pitiful ambition in the fool that uses it. <laughs> Go, <laughs> make you ready. <laughs> Uh, now, my lord, will the king hear this piece of work? And the queen, too, and that presently. Bid the players make haste. Aye, my lord. Will you two help to hasten them? We will, we my, will lord. my lord. What, oh, Horatio. Here, sweet lord. At your service. Horatio, thou art e'en as just a man as e'er my conversation coped with a... Oh, my dear lord. Nay, do not think I flatter. For what advancement may I hope from thee that no revenue hast but thy good spirits to feed and clothe thee? Why should the poor be flattered? No, let the candid tongue lick absurd pomp, and crook the pregnant hinges of the knee where thrift may follow fawning. Dost thou hear? Since my dear soul was mistress of her choice, and could of men distinguish, her election hath sealed thee for herself. For thou hast been as one in suffering all that suffers nothing. A man that fortunes, buffets, and rewards has ta'en with equal thanks. And blessed are those whose blood and judgment are so well commingled that they are not a pipe for fortune's finger to sound what stop she please. Give me that man that is not passion's slave, and I will wear him in my heart's core. Aye, in my heart of heart, as I do thee. <coughs> Something too much of this. There is a play tonight before the king. One scene of it comes near the circumstance which I have told thee of my father's death. I prithee, when thou seest that act afoot, even with a very comment of thy soul, observe my uncle. If his occulted guilt do not itself unkennel in one speech, it is a damned ghost that we have seen, and my imaginations are as foul as Vulcan stithy. Give him heedful note. For I, mine eyes, will rivet to his face, and after we will both our judgments join to censure of his scene. Well, my lord, if he steal aught the whilst this play is playing and scape detecting, I will pay the theft. They are coming to the play. I must be idle. Get you a place. How fares our cousin Hamlet? Excellent, i' faith. Of the chameleon's dish, I eat the air. Promise, Graham. You cannot feed capons so. I have nothing but his answer, Hamlet. These words are not mine. No, nor mine, now. <laughs> my lord, you played once at the university, you say? That I did, my lord. It was a county to good actor. And what did you enact? I did enact Julius Caesar. I was killed in the Capitol. Brutus killed me. <laughs> it was a brute part of him to kill so capital a calf there. <laughs> Be the players ready. Aye, my lord. They stay upon your patience. Come hither, my good Hamlet. Sit by me. No, oh, good mother, here's metal more attractive. Oh, my lord, you mark that. Lady, shall I lie in your lap? No, my lord. I mean my head upon your lap. Aye, my lord. You think I meant country matters? I think nothing, my lord. That's a fair thought to lie between maid's legs. What is my lord? Enough. You are merry, my lord. Who are? I, my lord. Oh, God, you're only jig maker. What should a man do but be merry? For look you, how cheerfully my mother looks, and my father died within two hours. It is twice two months, my lord. So long. Nay, then let the devil wear black, for I'll have a suit of sables. Oh, heavens, died two months ago and not forgotten yet. Then there's hope a great man's memory may outlive his life half a year. <laughs> but by our lady, he must build churches then, or else shall he suffer not thinking on with the hobby horse, whose epitaph is, for oh, for oh, the hobby horse is forgot. 
My lord. Harry, this is Mitching Malico. It means mischief. But like this show imports the argument of the play. Uh, we shall know by this fellow. The players cannot keep counsel. They'll tell all. Will he tell us what this show meant? I only showed that you show him. Be not you ashamed to show. He'll not shame to tell you what it means. You are not. You are not. I'll mark the play. For us and for our tragedy... Here, stooping to your clemency, we beg your hearing, patiently. Is this a prologue or the posy of a ring? It is brief, my lord. As woman's love. <laughs> Full thirty times hath Phoebus' cart gone round, Neptune's salt wash. And Pellas orbit ground, and thirty dozen moons with borrowed sheen about the world have times twelve thirties been. Since love our heart, and high men did our hands unite commutual in most sacred band. So many journeys may the sun and moon make us again count o'er ere love be done. But woe is me, you are so sick of late, so far from cheer. And from your former state, that I distrust you. Yet, though I distrust, discomfort you, my lord, if nothing must. For women's fear and love holds quantity in neither aught or in extremity. Now, what my love is, proof hath made you know, and as my love is sized, my fear is so. Where love is great, the littlest doubts are fear. Where little fears grow great, Great love grows there. <laughs> I must leave thee, love, and shortly too. My operant powers their functions leave to do. And thou shalt live in this fair world behind, honored, beloved, and happily one as kind for husband shall pass. Oh, confound the rest! Oh. Such love must needs be treason in my breast. In second husband, let me be a cast. None wed the second, but who killed the first. What? Wormwood, the wormwood. The that second marriage move are base respects of threat, but none of love. A second time I kill my husband dead when second husband kisses me in bed. <laughs> I do believe you think what now you speak. But what we do determine oft we break. Purpose is but the slave to memory of violent birth, but poor validity, which now, like fruit unripe, sticks on the tree, but fall unshaken when they mellow be. Most necessary it is that we forget to pay ourselves what to ourselves is debt. What to ourselves in passion we propose, the passion ending, doth the purpose lose. The violence of either grief or joy, their own enactures with themselves destroy. Where joy most revels, grief doth most lament. Grief 
joy, joy green on slender accident. This world is not for I. No, tis not strange that even our loves should with our fortune change. But there's a question left us yet to prove whether love lead fortune or else fortune love. <laughs> the great man down, you mark his favorite, flies. The poor advance makes friends of enemies. And hitherto doth love on fortune tend. For who not needs shall never lack a friend. And who in want a hollow friend doth try, directly seasons him his enemy. But, order let you end where I begun, our wills and fates do so contrary run that our devices still are overthrown, our thoughts are ours, their end none of our own. So think thou wilt no second husband wed, but die thy thought when thy first lord is dead. No earth to me <coughs> give food, nor heaven light, sport and repose lock from me day and night, to desperation turn my trust and hope, an anchor's cheer in prison be my scope, each opposite that blanks the face of joy, meet what I would have well, and it destroy, both here and hence, pursue me lasting strife, if once a widow ever I be wife. If she should break it now. Is deeply sworn. Sweet, leave me here a while. My spirits grow dull, and fain I would beguile the tedious day with sleep. Sleep, rock thy brain, and never come the mischance between us twain. Uh, Madam, I like you this play. The lady doth protest too much, methinks. Oh, but she'll keep her word. Have you heard the argument? Is there no offence in? No, no, they do but jest. Poison in jest. No offence in the world. What do you call the play? The Mousetrap. Marry how? Tropically. This play is the image of a murder done in Vienna. Gonzago is the Duke's name, his wife Baptista. You shall see a nod is a knavish piece of work, but what of that? Your Majesty, and we that have free souls, it touches us not. Let the gold jade wince. Our withers are unwrung. This is one Lucianus, nephew to the king. You are as good as a chorus, my lord. I could interpret between you and your love if I could see the puppets dallying. You are king, my lord. You are king. Take off my edge. Still better and worse. So you mistake your husbands. Begin, murderer. Parks, leave that damnable faces and begin. Come, the croaking raven doth bellow for revenge. Thoughts black, hands apt, drugs fit, a time agreeing, confederate season, else no creature seeing. Thou mixture rank of midnight weeds collected with Hecate's ban thrice blasted, thrice infected, thy natural magic and dire property on wholesome life usurp immediately. He poisons him with the garden for his estate. His name's Gonzago. The story is extant and written in very choice Italian. You shall see anon how the murderer gets the love of Gonzago's wife. Oh. Oh. <laughs> The king rises. What? Frighted with false fire? Affairs, my lord. Give her the plate. Give me some light. Away! I let the stricken deer go weep. The heart ungalled play. For some must watch while some must sleep. So runs the world away. Would not this, sir, and a forest of feathers, if the rest of my fortunes turn Turk with me, with two provincial roses on my raised shoes, get me a fellowship in a cry of players, sir? Oh, for sure. A whole one eye. But thou dost know, O oh, Damon dear, this realm dismantled was of Jove himself, and now reigns here a very, very peacock. Oh, you might have <laughs> right. Oh, good Horatio. 
I'll take the ghost word for a thousand pound. Didst perceive? Very well, my lord. Upon the talk of the poisoning. I did very well note him. Mm. Ah. Ah, ah, come, some music, come, the recorders. For if the king like not the comedy, why then, belike, he likes it not, paddy. Come, some music. Good my lord, if I'd take me a word with you. Sir, a whole history. The king, sir. Aye, sir, what of him? Is in his retirement marvellous distempered. Uh, with drink, sir. No, my lord, rather with choler. Your wisdom should show itself more richer to signify this to his doctor, for for me to put him to his purgation would perhaps plunge him into far more choler. Good my lord, put your discourse into some frame, and start not so wildly from my affair. I am tame, sir, pronounce. The queen, your mother, in most great affliction of spirit, hath sent me to you. You are welcome. Nay, good my lord, this courtesy is not of the right breed. If it shall please you to make me a wholesome answer, I will do your mother's commandment. If not, your pardon and my return shall be the end of my business. Sir, I cannot. What, my lord? Make you a wholesome answer. My wit's diseased. But, sir, such answers as I can make you shall command, or rather, as you say, my mother. Therefore, no more but to the matter. My mother, you say. Then thus she says... Your behaviour hath struck her into amazement and admiration. A oh, wonderful son that can so astonish a mother. But is there no sequel at the heels of this mother's admiration? In part. She desires to speak with you in her closet ere you go to bed. We shall obey were she ten times our mother. Have you any further trade with us? My lord, you once did love me. So I do still by these pickers and stealers. Good my lord, what is your cause of distemper? You do surely bar the door of your own liberty if you deny your griefs to your friend? Sir, I lack advancement. Well, how can that be, when you have the voice of the king himself for your succession in Denmark? Aye, sir, but while the grass grows, the uh, proverb is something musty. Oh, the recorder, let me see. To withdraw with you. Why do you go about to recover the wind of me as if you would drive me into a toil? Well, my lord, if my duty be too bold, my love is too unmannerly. Uh, I do not well understand that. Will you play upon this pipe? My lord, I cannot. I pray you. Believe me, I cannot. I do beseech you. <laughs> no, no touch of it, my lord. It is as easy as lying. Govern these vintages with your finger and thumb. Give it breath with your mouth, and it will discourse most eloquent music. Look you, these are the stops. But these cannot I command to any utterance of harmony. I have not the skill. Why, look you now, how unworthy a thing you make of me. You would play upon me. You would seem to know my stops. You would pluck out the heart of my mystery. You would sound me from my lowest note to the top of my compass. And there is much music, excellent voice, in this little organ, yet cannot you make it speak. Blood! Do you think that I am easier to be played on than a pipe? Call me what instrument you will, though you can fret me, yet you cannot play upon me. Oh, God bless you, sir. My lord. The Queen would speak with you, and presently. Do you see yonder cloud that's almost in shape of a camel? Well, uh, by the mass, it is like a camel indeed. Uh, Methinks tis like a weasel. It is bat like a weasel. Or like a whale. Very like a whale. Then I will come to my mother by and by. They fool me to the top of my bent. I will come by and by. I will say so. By and by is easily said. Leave me, friends. My lord. "'Tis now the very witching time of night, when churchyards yawn, and hell itself breathes out contagion to this world. Now could I drink hot blood, and do such bitter business as the day would quake to look on. Soft, now to my mother, O oh heart, Lose not thy nature. Let not ever the soul of Nero enter this firm bosom. Let me be cruel, not unnatural. I will speak daggers to her, but use none. My tongue and soul in this be hypocrites. 
how in my words some ever she be shent, to give them seals, never my soul consent. I like him not, nor stands it safe with us to let his madness range. Therefore prepare you, I your commission will forthwith dispatch, and he to England shall along with you. The terms of our estate may not endure a hazard so dangerous as doth hourly grow out of his lunacies. We will ourselves provide. Most holy and religious fear it is to keep those many, many bodies safe that live and feed upon your majesty. Aye, this single and peculiar life is bound with all the strength and armour of the mind to keep itself from annoyance. But much more that spirit upon whose wheel depends and rests the lives of many. Yeah. Their cease of majesty dies not alone, but like a gulf doth draw what's near it with it. Mm. It is a massy wheel yeah. fixed on the summit of the highest mount, to whose huge spokes ten thousand lesser things are mortised and adjoined, which, when it falls, each small annexment petty consequence attends the boisterous ruin. Yeah. Never alone did the king sigh, but with a general groan. Arm you, I pray you, to this speedy voyage, for we will fetters put upon this fear, which now goes too free-footed. We will hasten. We will hasten. My lord, He's going to his mother's closet. Behind the arras, I'll convey myself to hear the process. I'll warrant she'll tax him home. And as you said, and wisely was it said, tis meet that some more audience than a mother, since nature makes them partial, should all hear the speech advantage. Fare you well, my dish. I'll call upon you ere you go to bed and tell you what I know. Thanks, dear my lord. All my offence is rank. It smells to heaven. It hath the primal eldest curse upon't, a brother's murder. Pray can I not, though inclination be as sharp as will, my stronger guilt defeats my strong intent, and like a man to double business bound, I stand in pause where I shall first begin and both neglect. What if this cursed hand were thicker than itself with brother's blood? Is there not rain enough in the sweet heavens to wash it white as snow? Where too serves mercy but to confront the visage of offence? And what's in prayer but this twofold force to be forestalled ere we come to fall, or pardoned being down? Then I'll look up. My fault is past. But, oh, what form of prayer can serve my turn? Forgive me my foul murder. That cannot be, since I am still possessed of those effects for which I did the murder. My crown, mine own ambition, and my queen. May one be pardoned and retain the offence. In the corrupted currents of this world, offence's gilded hand may shove by justice, and oft is seen the wicked prize itself buys out the law. But tis not so above. There is no shuffling. There the action lies in his true nature, and we ourselves, compelled even to the teeth and forehead of our faults, to give in evidence. What then? What rests? Try what repentance can. What can it not? Yet what can it when one cannot repent? O oh, wretched state! O oh, bosom black as death! O oh, limey soul that struggling to be free art more engaged! Help, angels! Make a say! Bow, stubborn knees! And heart with strings of steel! Be soft as sinews of the newborn babe. All may be well. Now might I do it, Pat. Now he is a-praying. And now I'll do it. And so he goes to heaven. And so am I revenged. Huh? That would be scanned. A villain kills my father, and for that I his sole son do this same villain send to heaven. 
Oh, this is hire and salary, not revenge. He took my father grossly full of bread, with all his crimes broad-blown as flush as may, and how his audit stands who knows save heaven, but in our circumstance and course of thought tis heavy with him. And am I then revenged to take him in the purging of his soul, when he is fit and seasoned for his passage? No. Up, sword, and know thou a more horrid hent. When he is drunk asleep, or in his rage, or in the incestuous pleasure of his bed, at gaming, swearing, or about some act that hath no relish of salvation in it, then trip him that his heels may kick at heaven, and that his soul may be as damned and black as hell whereto it goes. My mother stays. This physic but prolongs thy sickly days. <laughs> my words lie up. My thoughts remain below. Words without thoughts never to heaven go. He will come straight. Look you, lay home to him. Tell him his pranks have been too broad to bear with, and that your grace has screamed and stood between much heat and him. I'll silence me even here. Pray you be round with him. I warrant you, fear me not. It's all behind the arras. I hear him coming. Oh. Now, oh, mother. What's the matter? Hamlet, thou hast thy father much offended. Mother, you have my father much offended. Come, come, you answer with an idle tongue. Go, go, you questioned with a wicked tongue. Why, how now, Hamlet? What's the matter Have now? you forgot me? No, by the rood, not so. You are the queen, your husband's brother's wife. And would it were not so, you are my mother. Nay, then, I'll set those to you that can I speak. I <laughs> sit you down. You shall not budge, you go not, till I set you up a glass where you may see the inmost part of you. What will thou do? Huh? Thou wilt not murder huh? me? Huh? Oh, help! Huh? Help! Oh! Oh, help! Help! Hannah, help! A rat, dead for a ducat, dead! Ah! Oh, 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 me, what hast thou done? Nay, I know not. Is it the king? Oh, what a rash and bloody deed is this! A bloody deed, almost as bad, good mother, as kill a king and marry with his brother. As kill a king! Aye, lady, t'was my word. <laughs> Thou wretched, rash, intruding fool! <laughs> Farewell. I took thee for thy better. Take thy fortune. Thou findest to be too busy as some danger. Leave wringing of your hands. Sit you down, and let me wring your heart. For so I shall, if it be made of penetrable stuff. If damned custom have not brassed it so that it is proof and bulwark against sense. What have I done that thou darest wag thy tongue in noise so rude against me? Such an act that blurs the grace and blush of modesty, calls virtue hypocrite, takes off the rose from the fair forehead of an innocent love and sets a blister there, makes marriage vows as false as dicer's oaths, oh, such a deed as from the body of contraction plucks the very soul and sweet religion makes a rhapsody of words heaven's taste doth glow yea this solidity and compound mass with tristful visage as against the doom is thought sick at the act i mean what act that roars so loud and thunders in the index look here upon this picture huh? and on this a counterfeit presentment of two brothers. See what a grace was seated on this brow. Hyperion's curls, the front of Jove himself, an eye like Mars to threaten or command, a station like the herald Mercury new lighted on a heaven-kissing hill, a combination and a form indeed where every god did seem to set his seal to give the world assurance of a man. This was your husband. Look you now what follows. 
<laughs> Here is your husband, like a mildewed <laughs> ear, blasting his wholesome brother. Have you eyes? Hmm? Could you on this fair mountain leave to feed and button on this moor? Ha? Have you eyes? <laughs> You cannot call it love, for at your age the heyday and the blood is tame. It's humble and waits upon the judgment. And what judgment would stoop from this to this? Sense, sure you have, else you could not have motion. But sure, that sense is apoplexed, for madness would not err. Nor sense to ecstasy was ne'er so thralled, but it reserved some quantity of choice to serve in such a difference. What devil was that? that thus hath cousined you at hoodman blind eyes without feeling feeling without sight ears without hands or eyes smelling sounds all or but a sickly part of one true sense could not so mope oh shame where is thy blush rebellious hell if thou canst mutine in a matron's bones to flaming youth let virtue be as wax and melt in her own fire proclaim no shame when the compulsive ardour is the charge since frost itself as actively doth burn and reason panders will. oh hamlet speak no more thou turnst mine eyes into my very soul and there I see such black and grained spots as will not leave their tinct. Nay, but to live in the rank sweat of an inseamed bed, stewed in corruption, honeying and making love over the nasty sty. Oh, speak to me no more. These words like daggers enter in mine ears. No more, sweet a murderer Hamlet. and a villainous slave that is not twentieth part the tithe of your precedent lord, a vice of kings, a cut purse of the empire and the rule that from a shelf the precious dagger them stole and put it in his pocket. No more! A king of shreds and patches! <laughs> oh, and hover with me with your wings, you heavenly guards! What would you, gracious figure? Oh, yes. He's mad. Not you come your tardy son to chide, but lapsed in time and passion. Let's go by the important acting of your dread command. Oh, say! Do not forget. This visitation is but to whet thy almost blunted purpose. Uh, but look, amazement on my mother sits. Oh, step between her and her fighting soul. Conceit in weakest bodies, strongest works. Speak to her, Hamlet. How is it with you, lady? Alas, how is it with you? That you do bend your eye on vacancy and with the incorporal air do hold discourse. For that your eyes, your spirits wildly peep. And as the sleeping soldiers in the alarm, your bedded hair, like life in excrement, start up and stand on end. Oh, gentle sun, upon the heat and flame of thy distemper, sprinkle cool patience. Where on do you look? On him! On him! Look, you have pale he his form and cause conjoined preaching to stones would make them capable do not look upon me lest with this piteous action you convert my stern effects then what i have to do will want true color tears perchance for blood to whom do you speak this do you see nothing there nothing at all Yet all that is, I see. Nor did you nothing here? No, nothing but ourselves. Why look you there? Look how it steals away. <laughs> My father, in his habit as he lived. Look where he goes, <laughs> even now, out at the portal. This is a very coinage of your brain. Huh? This bodiless creation, ecstasy, is very cunning and... My pulse as yours doth temperately keep time, and makes as healthful music. It is not madness that I have uttered. Bring me to the test, and I the matter will reword which madness would gamble from. 
mother, for love of grace, lay not that flattering unction to your soul, that not your trespass, but my madness speaks. It will but skin and film the ulcerous place, whilst rank corruption, mining all within, infects unseen. Confess yourself to heaven, repent what's past, avoid what is to come, and do not spread the compost or the weeds to make them rancor. Forgive me this, my virtue. For in the fatness of these percy times, virtue itself of vice must pardon beg. Yea, curb and woo for leave to do him good. Oh, Hamlet, thou hast cleft my heart in twain. Oh, throw away the worser part of it, and live the purer with the other heart. But go not to my uncle's bed. Assume a virtue if you have it not. That monster custom, who all sense doth eat of habits vile, is angel yet in this, that to the use of actions fair and good he likewise gives a frock or livery that aptly is put on, refrain for night, and that shall lend a kind of easiness to the next abstinence, the next more easy for use almost can change the stamp of nature, and either shame the devil or throw him out with one wondrous potency. Once more, good night. And when you are desirous to be blessed, I'll blessing beg of you. For this same Lord I do repent. But heaven has pleased it so to punish me with this and this with me, that I must be their scourge and minister. I will bestow him, and will answer well the death I gave him. So again, good night. I must be cruel, only to be kind. Thus bad begins, and worse remains behind. One word more, good lady. What shall I do? Not this. By no means that I bid you do. <laughs> Let the bloat king tempt you again to bed. Oh. Pinch wanton on your cheek, call you his mouse, and let him for a pair of reachy kisses, or paddling in your neck with his damned fingers, make you to ravel all this matter out, that I essentially am not in madness, but mad in craft. For good you let him know. For who that's but a queen, fair, sober, wise, would from a paddock, from a bat, a jib, such dear concernings hide? Who would do so? No, in despite of sense and secrecy, unpeg the basket on the house's top, let the birds fly, and like the famous ape, to try conclusions, in the basket creep, and break your own neck down. Be thou assured, if words be made of breath, and breath of life, I have no life to breathe what thou hast said to me. I must to England, you know that. Oh, alack, I had forgot. Tis so concluded on. There's letters sealed, and my two schoolfellows, whom I will trust as I will adders fanged, they bear the mandate, they must sweep my way and marshal me to knavery. Let it work. But tis the sport to have the engineer hoist with his own petard, and she'll go hard, but I will delve one yard below their minds and blow them at the moon. Oh, tis most sweet, when in one line two crafts directly meet. This man shall set me packing. I'll lug the guts into the neighbour room. Mother, good night indeed. <laughs> this... Ancilla is now most still, most secret, and most grave, who was in life a foolish, prating knave. Come, sir, to draw toward an end with you. Good night. Oh! <laughs>
<laughs> There's matter in these sighs, these profound heaves. You must translate, tis fit we understand them. Where is your son? Bestow this place on us a little while. Madam, madam. Ah, oh, my good lord, what have I seen tonight? What, Gertrude? How does Hamlet? Mad as the sea and wind, when both contend, which is the mightier. In his lawless fit, behind the arras, hearing something stir, whips out his rapier, cries, a rat, a rat, and in his brainish apprehension kills the unseen good old man. Oh, heavy deed! <laughs> it happened so with us, had we been there. His liberty is full of threats to all, to you, yourself, to us, to everyone. <laughs> Alas, how shall this bloody deed be answered? It will be laid to us, whose providence should have kept short, restrained, and out of hold this mad young man. But so much was our love, we would not understand what was most fit, but like the owner of a foul disease, to keep it from divulging, let it feed even on the pit of life. Where is he gone? To draw apart the body he hath killed, or whom... His very madness, like some ore among a mineral of metal's base, shows itself pure. He weeps for what is done. Oh, Gertrude, come away. The sun no sooner shall the mountains touch, but we will ship him hence. And this vile deed we must with all our majesty and skill, both countenance and excuse. Ho, oh, Gildenstern, my lord. My lord. Friends, both, go join you with some further aid. Hamlet, in madness, hath Polonius slain, and from his mother's closet hath he dragged him. Go, seek him out, speak fair, and bring the body into the chapel. I pray you, haste in this. Yes, my lord. Come, Gertrude. We'll call up our wisest friends to let them know both what we mean to do and what's untimely done. For, haply, slander, whose whisper o'er the world's diameter as level as the cannon to his blank transports his poison shot, may miss our name and hit the woundless air. Oh, come away. Oh. <laughs> My soul is full of discord and dismay. <laughs> Safely stowed. What noise? Who calls on Hamlet? Oh, oh, oh. Here they come. Ah, what have you done, my lord, with the dead body? Compounded it with dust where to tis kin. Tell us where it is that we may take it thence and bear it to the chapel. Uh, do not believe it. Believe what? That I can keep your counsel and not mine own. Besides, to be demanded of a sponge, what replication should be made by the son of a king? Take you me for a sponge, my lord. Aye, sir, that soaks up the king's countenance, his rewards, his authorities. But such officers do the king best service in the end. He keeps them like an ape and apple in the corner of his jaw, first mouth to be last swallowed. When he needs what you have gleaned. It is but squeezing you, and sponge, you shall be dry again. I understand you not, my lord. I am glad of it. A knavish speech sleeps in a foolish ear. My lord! You must tell us where the body is and go with us to the king. The body is with the king, but the king is not with the body. The king is a thing. A thing, my lord? Of nothing. Bring me to him. Hey, Fox! And all after! Oh! I have sent to seek him. And to find the body. How dangerous is it that this man goes loose? Yet must not we put the strong lord on him? He's loved of the distracted multitude, who like not in their judgment but their eyes. And where tis so, the offender's scourge is weighed, but never the offence. To bear all smooth and even, this sudden sending him away must seem deliberate pause. Diseases desperate grown by desperate appliance are relieved or not at all. How now? What has befallen? Where the dead body is bestowed, my lord, we cannot get from but him. But where is he? Without, my lord, guarded to know your pleasure. Bring him before us! Oh, Gildenstern! Bring in, my lord. Now, Hamlet, where's Polonius? At supper. At supper? 
Where? Not where he eats, but where he is eaten. Oh. A certain convocation of politic worms are in at him. Your worm is your only emperor for diet. We fat all creatures else to fat us, and we fat ourselves for maggots. Oh. Your fat king and your lean beggar is but variable service. Two dishes, but to one table. That's the end. Alas, A man may fish with a worm that hath eat of a king, and eat of the fish that hath fed of that worm. What dost thou mean by this? Nothing but to show you how a king may go a progress through the guts of a beggar. Where is Polonius? In heaven. Send thither to see. If your messenger find him not there, seek him at the other place yourself. Oh, but my. indeed, if you find him not within this month, you shall nose him as you go up the stairs into the lobby. Go, seek him there. Uh, he will stay till you come. Hamlet, this deed of thine, for thine especial safety, which we do tender, as we dearly <laughs> grieve for that which thou hast done, must send thee hence with fiery quickness. Therefore prepare thyself, the bark is ready, and the wind at help, the associates tend, and everything is bent for England. For England? Aye, Hamlet. Good. So is it, if thou knewst our purpose. I see a cherub that sees them. But come, for England, farewell, dear mother. Thy loving father, Hamlet. My mother, father and mother is man and wife. Man and wife is one flesh. And so, my mother. Come, for England. Follow him at foot, tempt him with speed aboard. Delay it not, I'll have him hence tonight. Away, for everything is sealed and done that else leans on the affair. Pray you make haste. Aye, my, my lord. lord. And England... If my love thou holdst at aught, as my great power thereof may give thee sense, since yet thy secretress looks roared and red after the Danish sword, and thy free oar pays homage to us, thou mayst not coldly set our sovereign purpose, which imports at full, by letters congruing to that effect, the present death of Hamlet. Do it, England, for like the hectic in my blood he rages. And thou must cure me, till I know tis done, howe'er my haps, my joys were ne'er begun. Go, Captain. From me greets the Danish king. Tell him that by his license, Fortin Brass claims the conveyance of a promised march over his kingdom. You know the rendezvous. If that his majesty would aught with us, we shall express our duty in his eye. And let him know so. I will do it, my lord. Go safely on. Good sir, huh? whose powers are these? They are of nowhere, sir. How purposed, sir, I pray you? Against some part of Poland. Who commands them, sir? The nephew to old Norway, Fortinbras. Goes it against the main of Poland, sir, or for some frontier? Truly to speak, and with no addition, we go to gain a little patch of ground that hath in it no profit but the name. To pay five ducats, five, I would not farm it, nor will it yield to Norway or the Polar rank or rate should it be sold in fee. Why, then the Polak never will defend it. Yes, it is already garrisoned. Two thousand souls and twenty thousand ducats will now debate the question of the straw. This is the imposthume of much wealth and peace that inward breaks and shows no cause without why the man dies. I humbly thank you, sir. God by yourself. What please you go, my lord? I'll be with you straight. Go a little before. Aye, my lord. Aye, my lord. Oh, all occasions do inform against me and spur my dull revenge. What is a man, if his chief good and market of his time be but to sleep and feed? A beast, no more. Sure he that made us with such large discourse, looking before and after, gave us not that capability and godlike reason to fust in us unused? Now, whether it be bestial oblivion or some craven scruple of thinking too precisely on the event, a thought which quartered hath but one part wisdom and ever three parts coward, I do not know why yet I live to say this thing's to do, sith I have cause and will and strength and means to do it. Examples gross as earth exhort me. Witness this army of such mass and charge. 
led by a delicate and tender prince, whose spirit with divine ambition puffed, makes mouths at the invisible event, exposing what is mortal and unsure to all that fortune, death, and danger dare, even for an eggshell. Rightly to be great is not to stir without great argument, but greatly to find quarrel in a straw when honour's at the stake. How stand I, then, that have a father killed, a mother stained, excitements of my reason and my blood, and let all sleep, while to my shame I see the imminent death of twenty thousand men, that for a fantasy and trick of fame go to their graves like beds, fight for a plot whereon the numbers cannot try the cause, which is not tomb enough and continent to hide the slain. Oh, from this time forth, my thoughts be bloody, or be nothing worth. I will not speak with her. She is importunate. Indeed distract. Her mood will needs be pitied. What would she have? She speaks much of her father. Says she hears there's tricks of the world, and hems and beats her heart. Spurns enviously at straws, speaks things in doubt that carry but half sense. Her speech is nothing, yet the unshaped use of it doth move the hearers to collection. They aim at it, and botch the words up fit to their own thoughts, which, as her winks and nods and gestures yield them, indeed would make one think there might be thought, though nothing sure, yet much unhappily. Too good she were spoken with. For she may strew dangerous conjectures in ill-breeding minds. Let her come in. Yes, my lady. To my sick soul, as sin's true nature is, Each toy seems prologue to some great amiss. So full of artless jealousy is guilt, It spills itself in fearing to be spilt. Oh, where is the beauteous majesty of Denmark? Now, Ophelia. How should I your true love know from another one? By his cockle hat and staff and his sandals shoe. Alas, sweet lady, what imports this song? Say you? Nay, pray you, Mark. He is dead and gone, lady, oh. he is dead and gone. At his head a grass-green serpent is seal. A stone, Nectophilia. You mark. White his shroud as the mountains snow. Oh, no. Alas, look clouds, here, my lord. Which bewept to the grave did not go with true love showers. How uh, do you, pretty lady? Well, go the ill do. Mm. And they say the owl was a baker's daughter. <laughs> we know. What we are, but know not what we may be. God be at your table. Conceit upon her father. Oh, pray you, let's have no words of this. But when they ask you what it means, say you this. Tomorrow is St. Valentine's Day. All in the morning be time, and I am made at your window to be your valentine. Then up he rose and donned his clothes, and dupped the chamber door. Let in the maid, that out a maid, never departed more. Pretty your feeling. Indeed, la, without a note, I'll make an end on't. By Jis and by Saint Charity, alack and fie for shame. Young men will do it if they come to it. By cock, they are to blame. Quote she, before you tumbled me, you promised me to wed. So would I have done by yonder sun, 
and thou hast not come to my bed. How long has she been thus? I hope all will be well. We must be patient. But I cannot choose but weep to think. They should lay him in a cold ground. Oh, my brother shall know of it. So I thank you for your good counsel. Come, my coach. Good night, ladies. Good night, sweet ladies. Good night. Follow her close. Give her good watch, I pray you. Aye, my lord. Oh, this is the poison of deep grief. It springs all from her father's death. Oh, Gertrude, <clears throat> Gertrude, when sorrows come, they come not single spies, but in battalions. First her father slain, next your son gone, and he most violent author of his own just remove. The people, muddied, thick, and unwholesome in their thoughts and whispers for good Polonia's death. And we have done but wingly in hugger mugger to inter him. Poor Ophelia, divided from herself and her fair judgment, without of which we are pictures or mere beasts. Last, and as much containing as all these, her brother is in secret come from France, feeds on this wonder, keeps himself in clouds. And wants not buzzers to infect his ear with pestilent speeches of his father's death, where in necessity of matter beggared will nothing stick our persons to arraign in ear and ear. Oh, my dear Gertrude, this, like to a murdering peace in many places, gives me superfluous death. Alack, what noise is this? But where are my schwitzers? Let them guard the door. What is the matter? Save yourself, my lord. The ocean overpearing of his list eats not the flats with more impetuous haste than young Laertes in a riotous head or bears your offices. The rabble call him lord, and as the world were now but to begin, antiquity forgot, custom not known, the ratifiers and props of every word. They cry, choose we, Laertes shall be king. Caps, hands and tongues applauded to the clouds. Laertes shall be king! Laertes king! How cheerfully on the false trail they cry! Oh, this is counter, you false Danish dogs! The doors are broke! Where is this king? <gasps> Sirs, stand you all without. No! Oh, 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 you? <laughs> Give me leave. Uh, all right, we will. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Keep the door. O oh, thou vile king! Give me my father! Calmly, good Laertes! That drop of blood that's calm proclaims me bastard! Cries cuckold to my father! Grand's the harlot, even here between the chaste and smirched brow of my true mother! What is the cause, Laertes, that thy rebellion looks so giant-like? Let him go, Gertrude! <laughs> Do not fear our person. As such divinity doth hedge a king! That treason can but peep to what it would, acts little of his will. Tell me, Laertes, why thou art thus incensed? Let him go, Gertrude. <laughs> Speak, man. Where is my father? Dead. But not by him. Let him demand his fill. How came he dead? I'll not be juggled with. Hell, allegiance. Vows to the blackest devil. Conscience and grace to the profoundest pit. I dare damnation. To this point I stand. That both the worlds I give to negligence. Let come what comes. Only I'll be revenged most truly for my father. Who shall stay you? My will! Not all the world. And for my means. I'll husband them so well they shall go far with little. Good Laertes, if you desire to know the certainty of your dear father's death, 
Is it in your revenge that sweepstake you will draw both friend and foe, <laughs> winner and loser? None but his enemies. Will you know them, then? Oh, his good friends, thus wide, I'll open my arms, and like the kind light-rendering pelican, repass them with my blood. Why, now you speak like a good child and a true gentleman. But I am guiltless of your father's death, and am most sensibly in grief for it. It shall as level to your judgment pierce as day does to your eye. Make way there! Make way! How now? What noise is that? Oh, heat! Draw out my brains! Tears seven times salt burn out the sense and virtue of mine eye. By heaven, thy madness shall be paid by weight till our scale turns the beam. Oh, Rose of May. Dear maid, kind no, sister. No, no. Queen Zephelia! Oh, oh, heavens. It's possible a young maid's wits should be as mortal as an old man's life. Nature is fine in love. And wet is fine. It sends some precious instance of itself after the thing it loves. In the first on the pier, hey nonny, 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 hey nonny, and on his grave rain many a tear. Fare you well, my dove. Hadst thou thy wits, and didst persuade revenge, it could not move thus. You must sing a downer a down, and you call him a downer. Oh, how the wheel becomes it. It is the false steward that stole his master's daughter. This nothing's more than matter. There's Rosemary. That's for remembrance. Pray, love, remember. And there is pansies. That's for thoughts. A document in madness. Thoughts and remembrance. Fitted. There's fennel for you and columbines. There's rue for you and there's some for me. We may call it Herba Grace on Sundays. Oh, you must wear your rue with a difference. Oh, there's a daisy. I would give you some violets, but they withered <laughs> when my father died. They say he made a good end. <laughs> For bonny sweet Robin is all my joy. Thought <clears throat> and affliction, passion, hell itself, <clears throat> she turns to favour and to prettiness. And will he not come again? And will he not come again? No, no, he is dead. Go to thy deathbed. He never will come again. His beard was as white as snow, all flaxen was his bow. He is gone, he is gone, and we cast away moan. God have mercy on his soul. And of all Christian souls, I pray God. God by you. Do you see this? Oh, God! Laertes, ah! I must commune with your grief, or you'll deny me right. Go but apart. Make choice of whom your wisest friends you will, and they shall hear and judge twixt you and me.
If by direct or by collateral hand they find us touched, we will our kingdom give, our crown, our life, and all that we call ours to you in satisfaction. <laughs> but if not, be you content to lend your patience to us, and we shall jointly labor with your soul to give it due content. Let this be so. His means of death. His obscure burial. No trophy, sword, nor hatchment o'er his bones. No noble right, nor formal ostentation. Cry to be heard, as twere from heaven to earth, that I must court in question. So you shall. And where the offence is, let the great axe fall. I pray you, go with me. What are they that would speak with me? Seafaring men, sir. They say they have letters for you. Let them come in. I, sir. I do not know from what part of the world I should be greeted, if not from Lord Hamlet. God bless you, sir. Let him bless thee, too. He shall, sir, and please him. There's a letter for you, sir. It comes from the ambassador that was bound for England. If your name be Horatio, as I'm left to know it is. Horatio, when thou shalt have overlooked this, give these fellows some means to the king. They have letters for him. Ere we were two days old at sea, a pirate of very warlike appointment gave us chase. Finding ourselves too slow of sail, we put on a compelled valour. In the grapple I boarded them. On the instant they got clear of our ship, so I alone became their prisoner. They have dealt with me like thieves of mercy, but they knew what they did. I am to do a good turn for them. Let the king have the letters I have sent, and repair thou to me with as much haste as thou wouldst fly death. I have words to speak in thine ear, will make thee dumb. Yet are they much too light for the bore of the matter. These good fellows will bring thee where I am. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern hold their cause for England. Of them I have much to tell thee. Farewell, he that thou knowest thine Hamlet. Come, I will give you way for these your letters, and do it the speedier, that you may direct me to him from whom you brought them. Now must your conscience my acquittance seal, and you must put me in your heart for friend. Sith you have heard, and with a knowing ear, that he which hath your noble father slain pursued my life. It well appears, but tell me. Why you proceeded not against these feats, so crimeful and so capital in nature, as by your safety, wisdom, all things else, you mainly were stirred up? Oh, for two special reasons, which may to you perhaps seem much insinuate, and yet to me they are strong. The queen, his mother, lives almost by his looks, and for myself, my virtue or my plague, be it either which, she's so conjunctive to my life and soul that... As the star moves not but in his sphere, I could not but by her. The other motive, why to a public count I might not go, is the great love the general gender bear him, who, dipping all his faults in their affection, would, like the spring that turneth wood to stone, convert his guilt to graces, so that my arrows, too slightly timbered for so loud a wind, would have reverted to my bow again, and not when I had aimed them. And so have I a noble father lost. A sister driven into desperate terms, whose worth, if praises may go back again, so challenge her on mount of all the age for her perfections. But my revenge will come. Break not your sleeps for that. You must not think that we are made of stuff so flat and dull that we can let our beard be shook with danger and think it past time. You shortly shall hear more. I loved your father, and we love ourselves. And that, I hope, will teach you to imagine. My lord. And now, what news? Letters, my lord, from Hamlet. Huh? This to your majesty, this to the queen. From Hamlet? Who brought them? Sailors, my lord, they say. I saw them not. They were given me by Claudio. He received them. There it is. You shall hear them. Yeah. Leave us. My lord. <clears throat> High and mighty, you shall know I am set naked on your kingdom. Tomorrow shall I beg leave to see your kingly eyes, when I shall, first asking your pardon, thereunto recount the occasion of my sudden and more strange return, Hamlet. What should this mean? Are all the rest come back, or is it some abuse and no such thing? Know you the hand? It is Hamlet's character. Naked? And it... 
in a postscript here. He says, alone. Then you advise me? I'm lost in it, my lord. But let him come. It warms the very sickness in my heart. And I shall live and tell him to his teeth. Thus didst thou. If it be so, Laertes, as how should it be so? How otherwise will you be ruled by me? If so, you'll not all rule me to a peace. To thine own peace. If he be now returned, as checking at his voyage, and that he means no more to undertake it, I will work him to an exploit now ripe in my device, under the which he shall not choose but fall. And for his death, no wind of blame shall breathe, but even his mother shall uncharge the practice and call it accident. My lord, I will be ruled. The rather if you could devise it so that I might be the organ. It falls right. You have been talked of since your travels much, and that in Hamlet's hearing, for a quality wherein they say you shine. Your summer parts did not together pluck such envy from him as did that one, and that in my regard of the unworthiest siege. What part is that, my lord? A very ribbon in the cap of youth. Yet needful, too, for youth no less becomes the light and careless livery that it wears than settled age, his sables and his weeds, importing health and graveness. Some two months since, he was a gentleman of Normandy. I've seen myself, and served against the French, and they can well on horseback. But this gallant had witchcraft in. He grew into his seat, and to such wondrous doing brought his horse, as he had been encorpsed and demi-natured with a brave beast. So far he passed my thought that I, in forgery of shapes and tricks, come short of what he did. A Norman was? A, a Norman. Upon my life, Lamour. The, the very same. I know him well. He is the brooch indeed, and gem of all the nation. He made confession of you. And gave you such a masterly report for art and exercise in your defence, and for your rapier most especially, that he cried out will be a sight indeed if one could match you, sir. The scrimmers of their nation, he swore, had neither motion guard nor I if you opposed them. This report of his did Hamlet so envenom with his envy that he could nothing do but wish and beg your sudden coming o'er to play with him. Now, out of this. What? Out of this, my lord. Laertes. Was your father dear to you? Or are you like the painting of a sorrow, a face without a heart? Why ask you this? Not that I think you did not love your father, but that I know love is begun by time, and that I see in passages of proof time qualifies the spark and fire of it. There lives within the very flame of love a kind of wick or snuff that will abate it. And nothing is it like goodness still, for goodness, growing to a pleurisy, dies in his own too much. That we would do, we should do when we would. For this would changes, and hath abatements and delays as many as there are tongues, are hands, are accidents. And then this should is like a spendthrift sigh that hurts by easing. But to the quick of the ulcer, Hamlet comes back. What would you undertake to show yourself your father's son in deed more than in words? To cut his throat at the church. No place indeed should murder sanctuaries. Revenge should have no bounds. A good Laertes, will you do this? Keep close within your chamber. Hamlet returned. Shall know you are come home. We'll put on those shall praise your excellence and set a double varnish on the fame the Frenchman gave you, bring you in fine together and wager on your heads. He, being remiss, most generous and free from all contriving, will not peruse the foils, so that with ease or with a little shuffling you may choose a sword unbated, and in a pass of practice requite him for your father. I will do it, and for that purpose I'll anoint my sword. I bought an unction of a mountebank so mortal that but knife in it. Where it draws blood, no cataplasm so rare, collected from all simples that have virtue under the moon, can save the thing from death that is but scratched with a I'll touch my point with this contagion, that if I gall him slightly, it may be death. Let's further think of this. Weigh what convenience both of time and means may fit us to our shape. If this should fail, and that our drift look through our bad performance to a better not assayed. Therefore this project should have a back or second, that might hold if this did blast in proof. Soft, let me see. We'll make a solemn wager on your cunnings. I have it! 
when in your motion you are hot and dry, as make your bouts more violent to that end, and that he calls for drink, I'll have prepared him a chalice for the nonce, whereon but sipping, if he by chance escape your venom stuck, our purpose may hold there. Anna? Sweet queen. One woe doth tread upon another's heels, so fast they follow. Your sisters drowned, Laertes. Drowned? Oh, where? There is a willow grows a slant of brook that shows his hall leaves in the glassy stream. There, with fantastic garlands, did she come, of crowflowers, nettles, daisies, and long purples, that liberal shepherds give a grosser name, but our cold maids do dead men's fingers call them. There on the pendant boughs her crowned weeds clambering to hang, an envious sliver broke, when oh. down the weedy trophies and herself fell in the weeping brook, her clothes spread wide, and mermaid like a while they bore her up, which time she chanted snatches of old tunes as one incapable of her own distress, or like a creature native and imbued unto that element. But long it could not be, till that her garments heavy with their drink pulled the poor wretch from her melodious lay to muddy death. Alas, then she is drowned. Drowned? Drowned? <laughs> Too much of water hast thou, poor Ophelia, and therefore I forbid my tears. But yet, it is our trick. Nature, her custom holds. A shame, say what it will. And when these are gone, the woman will be out. Adieu, my lord. I have a speech of fire that fain would blaze. But, but this folly doubts it. Let's follow, Gertrude. How much I had to do to calm his rage. Now fear I this will give it start again. Therefore, let's follow. Is she to be buried in Christian burial that willfully seeks her own salvation? I tell thee she is, and therefore make her grave straight. The crowner hath sat on her and finds it Christian burial. How can that be, unless she drowned herself in her own defence? Why? Tis found so. It must be so. Offendendo. It cannot be else. For here lies the point. If I drown myself wittingly, it argues an act. And an act have three branches. It is to act, to do, and to perform. There go, she drowned herself wittingly. Nay, but hear you, Goodman Delver. Give me leave. Here lies the water. Good. Here stands the man. Good. If the man go to this water and drown himself, it is, willy-nilly, he goes. Mark you that, but if the water come to him and drown him, he drowns not himself. Ergo, he that is not guilty of his own death shortens not his own life. But is this law? Aye, marry, it is. Crowner's quest law. Will you have the truth, aunt? If this had not been a gentlewoman... She should have been buried out of Christian burial. Why, there thou sayest. And the more pity that great folk should have countenance in this world to drown or hang themselves more than they're even Christian. Mm. Come, my spade. There is no ancient gentleman but gardeners, ditchers and grave makers. They hold up Adam's profession. Was he a gentleman? He was the first that ever bore arms. Why, he had none. What? Art a heathen? How dost thou understand the scripture? The scripture says Adam digged. Could he dig without arms? Nah. 
I'll put another question to thee. If thou answerest me not to the purpose, confess thyself. Go to. What is he that builds stronger than either the mason, the shipwright, or the carpenter? The gallows, mater, eh? Hey? <laughs> For that frame out lives a thousand tenants. Ah, I like thy wit well, in good faith. The gallows does well, but how does it well? It does well to those that do ill. Now thou dost ill to say the gallows is built stronger than the church. Here go, the gallows may do well to thee. Ha, 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 do it again. Come. Who builds stronger than a mason, a shipwright, or a carpenter? I tell me that, an unyoke. Marry, now I can tell. Toot! Oh, mass, I cannot tell. Ah, cudgel thy brains no more about it, for your dull ass will not mend his pace with beating. And when you are asked this question next, say a grave maker. Oh. The houses that he makes last till doomsday. Go get thee the yawn. Fetch me a stoop of liquor. Aye. In youth, when I did love, did love, me thought it was there. Has this fellow no feeling of his business that he sings at grave-making? Custom hath made it in him a property of easiness. And tis e'en so, the hand of little employment hath the daintier sense. That skull had a tongue in it and could sing once. How the knave jowls it to the ground as if it were Cain's jawbone that did the first murder. Mm. It might be the pate of a politician which this ass now or offices. One that would circumvent God, might it not? It might, my lord. Or of a courtier which could say, Good morrow, sweet lord, how dost thou, good lord? This might mean my lord such a one that praised my lord such a one's horse when he meant to beg it. Might it not? Aye, my lord. Why, and so. And now, my lady worms, chapless, and knocked about the mazard with a sexton's spade. Here's fine revolution, if we had the trick to see it. Did these bones cost no more the breeding but to play at loggets with them? Mm. Mine ache to think on't. There's another. Why might not that be the skull of a lawyer? Mm. Where be his quidits now, his quillets, his cases, his tenures and his tricks? Mm. Why does he suffer this rude knave now to knock him about the sconce with a dirty shovel <laughs> and will not tell him of his action of battery? <laughs> <laughs> this fellow might be in time a great buyer of land with his statutes, his recognances, his fines, his double vouchers, his recoveries. Is this the fine of his fines and the recovery of his recoveries? To have his fine pate full of fine dirt? Mm. Will his vouchers vouch him no more of his purchases, and double ones too, than the length and breadth of a pair of indentures? <laughs> the very conveyances of his lands will hardly lie in this box. And must the inheritor himself have no more? Huh? Not a job more, my lord. <laughs> Is not parchment made of sheepskins? Aye, my lord, and of calfskins, too. Mm -hmm. They are sheep and calves that seek out assurance in that. I will speak to this fellow. Whose grave's this, sirrah? Mine, sir. <laughs> I think it be thine indeed, for thou liest in't. You lie out on it, sir, and therefore it is not yours. For my part, I do not lie in't. And yet tis mine. Well, thou dost lie in to be in and say tis thine. Tis for the dead, not for the quick. Therefore thou liest. Tis a quick lie, sir. Twill away again from me to you. What man dost thou dig it for? For no man, sir. What woman, then? For none, neither. Who is to be buried in it? One that was a woman, sir, but rest her soul, she's dead. How absolute the knave is. Mm -hmm. We must speak by the card, or equivocation <laughs> will undo us. By the Lord, Horatio, these three years I have taken note of it, the age is grown so picked that the toe of the peasant comes so near the heel of the courtier, he galls his kibe. Mm. <laughs> How long hast thou been a grave-maker? Of all the days in the year, I came to it that day that our last King Hamlet, or oh, came fought in brass. How long is that since? Cannot you tell that? Every fool can tell that. It was the very day that young Hamlet was born. He that was mad and sent into England. Why, Mary, why was he sent into England? Why? Because he was mad. He shall recover his wits there, or if he do not, it's no great matter there. Why? 
Twill not be seen in him there. There the men are as mad as he. <laughs> How came he mad? Very strangely, they say. How strangely? Faith in with losing his wits. <laughs> Upon what ground? Why, here in Denmark. <sighs> I've been sexton here, man and boy, thirty years. How long will a man lie in the earth ere he rot? If faith, if he be not rotten before he die, as we have many pocky corpses nowadays that will scarce hold the laying in, he will last you some eight year or nine year. A tanner will last you nine year. Why he more than another? Why, sir, his hide is so tan with his trade that he will keep out water a great while, and your water is a sore decay of your wholesome dead body. Here's a skull now. This skull was lain in the earth three and twenty years. Whose was it? A wholesome mad fellow it was. Who do you think it was? Nay, I know not. A pestilence on him for a mad rogue. I pulled a flag of the Rhenish on my head once. <laughs> this same skull, sir, was Yorick's skull, the king's jester. This? In that? Let me see. <sighs> Alas, poor Yorick. I knew him, Horatio. Hmm? A fellow of infinite jest, of most excellent fancy. He hath borne me on his back a thousand times, and now how abhorred in my imagination it is. My gorge rises at it. Here hung those lips that I have kissed I know not how oft. Where be your jibes now, your gambols, your songs, your flashes of merriment that were wont to set the table on a roar? No one now to mock your own grinning, quite chop-fallen. <laughs> now get you to my lady's chamber and tell her, let her paint an inch thick, to this favour she must come. Make her laugh at that. Prithee, Horatio, uh, tell me one thing. What's that, my lord? Dost thou think Alexander looked to this fashion of the earth? Mm, in so. And smelt so? <laughs> in so, my lord. To what base uses we may return, Horatio? Why, may not imagination trace the noble dust of Alexander till he find it stopping a bunghole? It were to consider too curiously to consider so. No, faith, not a jot, but to follow him thither with modesty enough and likelihood to lead it. As thus, Alexander died, Alexander was buried. Alexander returneth into dust, the dust is earth, of earth we make loam, and why of that loam whereto he was converted, might they not stop a Beer barrel. Hmm. Imperial Caesar, dead and turned to clay, might stop a hole to keep the wind away. Oh, that that earth which kept the world in awe should patch a wall to expel the winter's floor. But soft, hmm. but soft, aside. Here comes the king. The queen, the courtiers. Who is it that they follow and with such maimed rites? For this doth betoken the corpse they followed did with desperate hand fordo it own life. It was of some estate. Couch we a while and mark. What ceremony else? That is Laertes, a very noble youth. Mark. What ceremony else? Her obsequies have been as far enlarged as we have warrantized. Her death was doubtful. And but that great command o'er sways the order, she should in ground unsanctified have lodged to the last trumpet. For charitable prayers, shards, flints, and pebbles should be thrown on her. Yet here she is allowed her virgin rites, her maiden instruments, and the bringing home of bell and burial. Must then no more be done? No more be done. We should profane the service of the dead to sing sage requiem and such rest to her as to peace parted souls. Lay her in the earth. From her fair and unpolluted flesh may violet spring. I tell thee, churlish priest, ministering angel shall my sister be when thou liest howling. What? The fair Ophelia? Sweets to the sweet. Farewell. I hope thou shouldst have been my Hamlet's wife. 
I thought thy bride bed to have decked, sweet maid, and not to have strewed thy grave. Oh, treble woe, for ten times treble on that cursed head, whose wicked deed thy most ingenious sense deprived thee of. Hold off the earth a while, till I have caught her once more in mine arms. Oh, yes. Now pile your dust upon the quick and dead, till of this flatter mountain you have made to our top of Pelion, or the skyish head of blue Olympus. What is he whose grief bears such an emphasis, whose phrase of sorrow conjures the wandering stars and makes them stand like wonder-wounded hearers? This is I, Hamlet the Dane. Oh, oh, take thy soul! Thou fresh not well. I prithee take thy fingers from my throat, for though I am not splenative and rash, Yet have I in me something dangerous which lets thy wiseness fear away thy hand. Pluck them asunder! Oh, oh, Lord, be quiet! Why, I will fight with him upon this theme until my eyelids will no longer wag. Oh, my son, what theme? I loved Ophelia. Forty thousand brothers could not with all their quantity of love make up my sum. What wilt thou do for her? Oh, he is mad, Laertes! For love of God, forbear him! Swoon, show me what thou'lt do! What weep, what fight, what fast, what tear thyself, what drink up eyes, I'll eat a crocodile! I'll do it! Dost thou come here to whine, to outface me with leaping in her grave? Be buried quick with her, and so will I. And if thou prate of mountains, let them throw millions of acres on us, till our ground singeing is paked against the burning zone. Make us a like a wart. Nay, and thou'lt mouth, I'll rant as well as thou. This is mere madness, and thus a while the fit will work on him. Anon as patient as the female dove, when that her golden couplets are disclosed, his silence will sit drooping. Hear you, sir. What is the reason that you use me thus? I loved you ever. But it is no matter. Let Hercules himself do what he may. The cat will mew, and dog will have his day. I pray you, go to Horatio. Wait upon him. Yes, my lord. Laertes. Strengthen your patience in our last night's speech. We'll put the matter to the present push. Good Gertrude, set some watch over your son. This grave shall have a living monument. An hour of quiet shortly shall we see. Till then, impatience, our proceeding be. <laughs> So much for this, Horatio. <coughs> now, let me see. The other. <coughs> you do remember all the circumstance? <laughs> remember it, my lord. Sir, in my heart there was a kind of fighting that would not let me sleep. Methought I lay worse than the mutines and the bilbos. Rashly, and praised be rashness for it. Let us know, our indiscretion sometimes serves us well when our deep plots do pall. And that should teach us. There's a divinity that shapes our ends. Rough hew them how we will. That is most certain. Uh, up from my cabin, my sea gown scarfed about me, in the dark, groped I to find out them, had my desire, fingered their packet, and in fine withdrew to mine own room again, making so bold, my fears forgetting manners, to unseal their grand commission, where I found Horatio, or oh, royal knavery, an exact command, larded with many several sorts of reason, importing Denmark's health and England's too, with oh, such bugs and goblins in my life, that on the supervise, no leisure baited, no not to stay the grinding of the axe, my head should be struck off. Is Possible. Here's the commission. Read it at more leisure. But wilt thou hear me how I did proceed? I beseech you. Being thus benetted round with villains, ere I could make a prologue to my brains, they had begun to play. 
I sat me down, devised a new commission, wrote it fair. I once did hold it, as our statists do, a baseness to write fair, and laboured much how to forget that learning. <laughs> but, sir, now it did me yeoman service. Wilt thou know the effect of what I wrote? Aye, good my lord. An earnest conjuration from the king, as England was his faithful tributary, as love between them like the palm should flourish, as peace should still her wheaten garland wear, and stand a comma between their amities and many such like asses of great charge, <laughs> that on the view and know of these contents, without debatement further, more or less, he should the bearers put to sudden death, not shriving time allowed. How was this sealed? Why, even in that was heaven ordinant. I had my father's signet in my purse, which was the model of that Danish seal. Ah. Folded the writ up in the form of the other, subscribed it, gave it the impression, placed it safely... The changeling never known. Now the next day was our sea fight, and what to this was sequent thou knowst already. So, Guildenstern and Rosencrantz go toot. Why, man, they did make love to this employment. They are not near my conscience. Their defeat doth by their own insinuation grow. It is dangerous when the baser nature comes between the pass and fell insensed points of mighty opposites. Why, what a... King is this? Does it not? Think'st thee stand me now upon? He that hath killed my king and whored my mother, popped in between the election and my hopes, thrown out his angle for my proper life, and with such cousinage, is not perfect conscience to quit him with this arm, and is not to be damned to let this canker of our nature come in further evil? It must be shortly known to him from England what is the issue of the business there. It will be short. The interim is mine. And a man's life, no more than to say one. But I am very sorry, good Horatio, that to Laertes I forgot myself. For by the image of my cause I see the portraiture of his. I'll court his favours. But sure, the bravery of his grief did put me into a towering passion. Mason, who comes here? Your lordship is right. Welcome back to Denmark. I humbly thank you, sir. Dost know this waterfly? No, my good lord. Uh, thy state is the more gracious, for it is a vice to know him. He hath much land and fertile. Hmm. Let a beast be lord of beasts, and his crib shall stand at the king's mess. Tis a chuff. But, as I say, spacious in the possession of dirt. Uh, sweet lord, if your lordship were at leisure, I should impart a thing to you from his majesty. I will receive it, sir, with all diligence of spirit. Put your bonnet to his right use, tis for the head. I thank your lordship. Tis very hot. No, believe me, tis very cold. The wind is northerly. It is indifferent cold, my lord, indeed. Yet methinks tis very sultry and hot for my complexion. Exceedingly, my lord. It is very sultry as for... Uh, I cannot tell how. But, my lord... His Majesty bade me signify to you that he hath laid a great wager on your head. Uh, sir, this is the matter... I beseech you, remember hmm? your hat. Uh, nay, good my lord, uh, for my ease, in good faith. Uh, sir, here is newly come to court, Laertes. Believe me, an absolute gentleman, mm -hmm. full of most excellent differences, of, of very soft society and great showing. Oh. Indeed, to, to speak feelingly of him, he is the, the card or calendar of gentry. <laughs> Uh, for you shall find in him the continent of what part a gentleman would see. Sir, his definement suffers no perdition in you, though I know to divide him inventorially would dizzy the arithmetic of memory, and yet but you're neither in respect of his quick sale, but in the verity of extolment, I take him to be a soul of great article, and his infusion of such dearth and rareness as to make true diction of him, is semblable as his mirror, and who else would trace him, his umbrage, nothing more. Your lordship speaks most infallibly of him. <laughs> the concernancy, sir. Why do we wrap the gentleman in our more raw breath? Sir? It's not possible to understand in another tongue. <laughs> you will do it, sir, really. <laughs> what imports the nomination of this gentleman? Of Laertes. His purse is empty already. All golden <laughs> words are spent. Of him, sir. I know you are not ignorant. I would you did, sir. Yet, in faith, if you did, it would not much approve me. Well, sir... You are not ignorant of what 
excellence, Laertes. Yeah, I dare not confess that, lest I should compare with him in excellence. But to know a man well were to know himself. I mean, sir, for his weapon. Ah. But in the imputation laid on him by them in his mead, he is unfellowed. Mm -hmm. uh, sir, you are not ignorant of what excellence Laertes is at his weapon. What's his weapon? A rapier and dagger. <laughs> That's two of his weapons, but well. The king, sir, hath waged with him six Barbary horses, against the which he hath imponed, as I take it, six French rapiers and poniards, with their signs as girdle, hangers, or so. Three of the carriage of faith are very dear to fancy, very responsive to the hilts, most delicate carriage, and a very liberal consent. What call you the carriage? I knew you must be edified by the margin <laughs> ere you had done. The carriage, sir, are the hangers. Uh, the phrase would be more germane to the matter if we could uh, carry cannon by our sides. I would it might be hangers till then. But on. Six Barbary horses against six French swords, there are signs, and three liberal, conceited carriage. <clears throat> That's the French bet against the Danish. Why is this uh, imponed, as you call it? The king, sir, hath laid, sir, that in a dozen passes between you and him, he shall not exceed you three hits. He hath laid on twelve and nine, and it would come to immediate trial if your lordship would vouchsafe the answer. How if I answer... No. I mean, my lord, the opposition of your person in trial. Sir, I will walk here in the hall. If it please his majesty, tis the breathing time of day with me. Let the foils be brought, the gentleman willing, and the king hold his purpose. I will win for him if I can. If not, I will gain nothing but my shame and the odd hits. Shall I re-deliver you in, sir? To this effect, sir, after what flourish your nature will. I commend my duty to your lordship. Yours, yours. He does well to commend it himself. There are no tongues else for his turn. This lapwing runs away with a shell on his head. He did comply with his dug before he sucked it. <laughs> Thus has he and many more of the same bevy that I know the drossy age dotes on. Only got the tune of the time and outward habit of encounter. A kind of yeasty collection which carries them through and through the most fanned and winnowed opinions, mm. and do but blow them to their trials, the bubbles are out. My lord, his majesty commended him to you by young Osric, who brings back to him that you attend him in the hall. Mm. He sends to know if your pleasure hold to play with Laertes, or that he will take longer time. <laughs> I am constant to my purposes. They follow the king's pleasure. If his fitness speaks, mine is ready. Now or whensoever, provided I be so able as now. The king and queen and all are coming down. In happy time. The queen desires you to use some gentle entertainment to Laertes before you fall to play. She well instructs me. My lord. You will lose this wager, my lord. I do not think so. Since he went into France, I have been in continual practice. I shall win at the odds. But... Thou wouldst not think how ill all's here about my heart. But it is no matter. Nay, good my lord. It is but foolery. But it is such a kind of game-giving as would perhaps trouble a woman. If your mind dislike anything, obey it. I will forestall their repair hither, and say you are not fit. Not a whit. We defy augury. There is a special providence in the fall of a sparrow. If it be now, it is not to come. If it be not to come, it will be now. If it be not now, yet it will come. The readiness is all. Since no man knows aught of what he leaves, what is't to leave betimes? Let be. <laughs> come, Hamlet, come and take this hand from me. Give me your pardon, Laertes. I have done you wrong, but pardon it as you're a gentleman. This presence knows, and you must needs have heard, how I am punished with a sore distraction. What I have done that might your nature 
honor and exception roughly awake, I here proclaim was madness. Was Hamlet wronged Laertes? Never Hamlet. If Hamlet from himself be taken away, and when he's not himself does wrong Laertes, then Hamlet does it not. Hamlet denies it. Who does it then? His madness. If it be so, Hamlet is of the faction that is wronged. His madness is poor Hamlet's enemy. Sir, in this audience, let my disclaiming from a purposed evil free me so far in your most generous thoughts that I have shot my arrow o'er the house and hurt my brother. I am satisfied in nature, whose motive in this case should stir me most to my revenge. But in my terms of honour, I stand aloof. Will no reconcilement till by some elder masters of known honour I have a voice and precedent of peace to keep my name ungored. But till that time, I do receive your offered love, like love, and will not wrong it. I do embrace it freely. And will this brother's wager frankly play? Give us the foils. Come on. Come one for me. I'll be your foil, Laertes. In mine ignorance, your skill shall, like a star in the darkest night, stick fiery off indeed. <laughs> you mock me, sir. No, by this hand. Give him the foils, young Osric. Cousin Hamlet, you know the wager? Very well, my lord. Your grace hath laid the odds of the weak aside. I do not fear it. I have seen you both. <laughs> but since he is bettered, we have their fall off. Uh, this is too heavy. Let me see another. Ah, yeah. Ah, this likes me. Well, these foils have all a length. Hmm? Ah, my good lord. Send me the stoops of wine upon my table. If Hamlet give the first or second hit, or quit in answer of the third exchange, let all the battlements their ordnance fire. The king shall drink to Hamlet's better breath. Oh, and in the cup, an union shall he throw. Richer than that which four successive kings in Denmark's crown have worn. Oh. Give me the cups. And let the kettle to the trumpet speak. The trumpet to the cannoneer without. The cannons to the heavens, the heaven to earth. Now the king drinks to Hamlet. <laughs> And you, the judges, bear a wary eye. <laughs> Come on, sir. Come, my lord. Ha! <laughs> hey! <laughs> Give me drink. Hamlet, this pearl is thine. Here's to thy health. Give him the cup. I'll play this boat first. Set it by a while. Come. Hey! <laughs> 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 a, a touch, I do confess. <laughs> Our son shall win. He's fat and scant of breath. <laughs> Here, Hamlet, take my napkin, rub thy brows. The queen carouses to thy fortune, Hamlet. Good, madam. Get it. Do not drink. I will, my lord. I pray you pardon me. It is the poison cup. It is too late. Hamlet. I dare not drink yet, madam. By and by. Come, let me wipe thy face. My lord, I'll hit him now. I do not think it. And yet, it is almost against my conscience. Come for the third, Laertes. You do but dally. I pray you pass with your best violence. I am afraid you make a wanton of me. Oh, say you so. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> 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 Nothing neither way. Yeah. How about you now? Oh. <laughs> <laughs>
I'll have at you with your own foil, Laertes. Oh. Part the failing sense! No. Come again. Look to the beat there! How can we read on both sides? How is it, my lord? How is Laertes? Why, as a woodcock to mine own spring, Osric. I'm justly killed with mine own treachery. How oh, does the queen? She swoons to see those bleeds. No, no. The drink. The drink. Oh, my dear Hamlet. The drink. The drink. I am Oh, villainy! Oh, let the door be locked. Treachery! Seek it out! It is here! Hamlet! Huh? Hamlet! Thou art slain. Huh? No medicine in the world can do thee good. In thee, there is not half an hour of life. The treacherous instrument is in thy hand. Unbaited and envenomed. Oh. <clears throat> the foul practice had turned itself on me. Lo, oh, here I lie, never to rise again. Thy mother's poisoned. Oh. I can no more. The king. The king's to blame! The point envenomed too. Then, Venom, to thy work now! Defeat me! Friends, I am but hurt! Thou incestuous, murderous, damned Dane, drink off this potion! Thy union here, follow my mother! He is justly served. It is a poison tempered by himself. I exchange forgiveness with me, noble Hamlet. Mine and my father's death come not upon thee, nor thine on me. Heaven make thee free of it. I follow thee. I am dead. Horatio. Oh, wretched queen, adieu. You that look pale and tremble at this chance, that are but mutes or audience to this act, had I but time, as this fell sergeant death is strict in his arrest. Oh, I could tell you. But let it be, Horatio, I am dead. Thou livest, report me and my cause aright to the unsatisfied. I never believe it. I am more an antique Roman than a Dane. Huh? Here's yet some liquor left. As thou art a man, give me the cup. Let go, by heaven, I'll have it. <laughs> oh, God, Horatio. What a wounded name, things standing thus unknown, shall live behind me. If thou didst ever hold me in thy heart, absent thee from felicity a while, and in this harsh world draw thy breath in vain to tell my story. What, what warlike noise is this? My lord! The unfortunate brass, with conquest, come from Poland to the ambassadors of England, gives this warlike volley. Oh, I die, Horatio. Mm. Potent poison quite all crows my spirit. I cannot live to hear the news from England, but I do prophesy the election lights on Fortin Brass. He has my dying voice. So tell him, with the occurrence, more and less, which have solicited the rest.
is silence. Now cracks a noble heart. Good night, sweet prince, and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. Why does the drum come hither? Where is this sight? What is it you would see? If aught of woe or wonder, cease your search. This quarry cries on havoc. Oh, proud death! What feast is toward in thine eternal cell that thou so many princes at a shot so bloodily hast struck? The sight is dismal, and our affairs from England come too late. The ears are senseless that should give us hearing to tell him his commandment is fulfilled. That Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Where should we have our thanks? Not from his mouth. Had it the ability of life to thank you. He never gave commandment for their death. But since so jump upon this bloody question, you from the Polak Wars and you from England are here arrived. Give order that these bodies high on a stage be placed to the view. And let me speak to the yet unknowing world how these things came about. So shall you hear of carnal, bloody, and unnatural acts, of accidental judgments, casual slaughters, of deaths put on by cunning and forced cause. And in this upshot, purposes mistook fallen on the inventor's heads. All this can I truly deliver. Let us haste to hear it, and call the noblest to the audience. For me, with sorrow, I embrace my fortune. I have some rights of memory in this kingdom, which now to claim my vantage doth invite me. Of that I shall have also cause to speak, and from his mouth, whose voice will draw on more. But let this same be presently performed, even while men's minds are wild lest more mischance on plots and errors happen. Let four captains bear Hamlet like a soldier to the stage, for he was likely, had he been put on, to have proved most royally. And for his passage, the soldier's music and the rites of war speak loudly for him. Take up the bodies. Such a sight as this becomes the field but here shows much amiss. Go, bid the soldiers shoot. In Hamlet, Prince of Denmark by William Shakespeare, Kenneth Branagh played Hamlet, Derek Jacobi, Claudius, Judy Dench, Gertrude, Richard Briers, Polonius, Michael Williams, Horatio, Sophie Thompson, Ophelia, James Wilby, Laertes, Michael Elphick, the first gravedigger, Michael Horden, the player king, Emma Thompson, the player queen, and John Gielgud, the ghost. Rosencrantz was played by Gerard Horan, Guildenstern by Christopher Ravenscroft, Osric by Richard Clifford, Fortinbras by James Simmons, Barnardo, Paul Gregory, Francesco, Alex Lowe, Marcellus Andrew Jarvis, second grave digger Mark Hadfield, Voltermand Sean Prendergast, and the gentlewoman Abigail Reynolds. 
The music was composed by Patrick Doyle and realized by Patrick Doyle and John Powell. The textual advisor was Dr. Russell Jackson. Technical presentation was by Wilfredo Acosta, Tim Sturgeon and Colin Guthrie, with the assistance of Douglas Hansel. The play was directed by Kenneth Branner and Glyn Dearman.